کشف دجا بجما حسون جمی السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو دا جلسہ سالانہ یو ایس اے لائیو براڈ کاسٹ بائی ایم ٹی اے اسٹوڈیوز یو ایس اے ایز یو نو دیٹ ان اے اسمال ہیملٹ ان کادیان جلسہ سالانہ بیگین اینڈ دس اسپرچل کنوینشن از کنٹینیوئنگ ہیئر ان دا یونائٹڈ اسٹیٹس وی آر بلیسڈ دیٹ سیونٹی تھری ایئرز اگو ان ڈیٹن اوہایو از ویئر دا فرسٹ جلسہ سالانہ یو ایس اے بیگین الحمد للہ Today, thousands are here in person and many are you joining online. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are all united by the blessings of Khilafat. Join us for the next three days as we take you into the main hall and we listen to speeches. We'll, we'll be able to educate ourselves. We'll be able to take you to different duties, show you the Langar Khana and other places where we'll be able to humble ourselves. And most importantly, we'll be able to interview with various um, 
um, participants so that we can inspire ourselves. So with that, we'll begin, inshallah, with the recitation of the Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا متشابها مثانية قشعر منه تقشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تلين ثم تلين جلودهم وقلوبهم إلى ذكر الله ذلك هدى الله يهدي به من يشاء وَمَن يُضْلِلِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ هَادٍ I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the Rejected in the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, Ever Merciful. Allah has sent down the best message in the form of a book whose verses are mutually supporting and repeated in diverse forms at which do creep the skins of those who fear their Lord. Then their skins and their hearts soften to the remembrance of Allah. Such is the guidance of Allah. He guides therewith whom He pleases. And he whom Allah adjudges astray, he shall have no guide. Sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. إن أحسن الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Holy Prophet peace be upon him stated, Surely, the best discourse is Allah's book, and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad, peace be upon him. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakallah again, welcome. And uh, as you know, I've mentioned already that we have a great history here in the United States of Jalsa Salana. Um, but I would like to first introduce uh, our host here, Adnan Bali Sahib. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. If you can also introduce for many of our Urdu speaking audience as well. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa apne tamam nazreen ko Jalsa Salana America 2023 ki brahiras nashriyat mein kush amadid kehte hain. Jalsa Salana, Jiski Bunyad, Azotak Dismasi Himaut, Alai Salam, Apne Mubarak Hat Seraki, Ajiski Shake Johe, Wo Tamam Atraf and Pajuki, and Tamam Mumalik Mijasa Salana Johe, Fuska in a Kadhora. Milkulis, Kushak, Alhamdulillah, we're very blessed that, uh, you know, in very various countries has been established, and the United States has a very rich history as well, um, starting in Dayton, Ohio, but many other places like New York City and other places have also hosted it in the past. Alhamdulillah, we are here in the farm show complex. Um, Adnan Bali Sahib, you can share also the experiences of some of the, the participants of attending Jalsa here. Yes, yes. In the name of God, we are making a great deal in the Jalsa Salana in America. And as we know from the Jalsa of the history, the first Jalsa Salana of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was started in 1891, and only 75 people have been working on it. But today, from the name of God, we are making a great deal صرف امریکہ میں ہی تہترواں جلسہ سالانہ جو ہے وہ منایا جا رہا ہے اس طرح کئی اور ممالک میں بھی جلسہ سالانہ جو ہے وہ اس کی بنیاد رکھی جا چکی ہے اور امریکہ کے طول اور سے مختلف جو احباب ہیں وہ جلسہ سالانہ کے برکات سے استفادہ کرنے کے لیے آ چکے ہیں اور ابھی جمعہ کے وقت ہم نے دیکھا کہ ہزارہ کی تعداد میں شاملی جو ہے وہ اس سے استفادہ کرنے کے لیے جلسہ گاہ میں جو ہے وہ آ چکے ہیں اور انشاءاللہ تعالی آئندہ تین دن جو ہے ہم مزید آپ کو اس بارے میں معلومات دیتے رہیں گے Absolutely, there's thousands of people today we were able to see it was an amazing experience and I'm glad, I think that's the point is to bring everybody together, the promise Messiah al-Islam establishes for many reasons for spirituality, enhance your spirituality to learn, to bring you know a group together so we can speak about God as we know the hadith also 
reflect on the blessings of just getting together and talking about God. And also, most importantly, is brotherhood, is establishing that unity and bond. And we know that that unity and bond, by the grace and mercy of Allah, is established through Khilafat. That is why we are here. That is why we are able to connect in these various countries and various places as well. And so that is the beautiful, I think, aspect. And I remember there was a, a sermon by beloved Hazur in 2018, where he in fact called Jalsa Sana even a training camp. Meaning it's a way for us to spend three days to really enhance ourselves, have those spiritual vibes and, you know, really just make ourselves better spiritually, whether it's our connection with our brothers we may not have seen for years, or not years, but for, for the past year, and many other things as well, slowly to be able to mend those relationships as well. Absolutely. And Hazrat Masih Mohd al-Islam has been saying that the most important thing is that people don't have to be able to do their own knowledge, جو ہے بہتری آئے بلکہ تربیت کے لحاظ سے یہی مقصد ہے کہ ان کی تربیت میں بہتری آئے ان کا خدا تعالیٰ کے ساتھ جو ہے وہ تعلق بڑھے اور آخرت کی جو ہے وہ فکر کریں اور یہی حضرت تجم سی الخام سید اللہ تعالیٰ ابن سل عزیز ہمیں جلسہ سرانہ کے جو خطابات ہوتے ہیں اس میں بتاتے رہتے ہیں کہ جو مین مقصد ہے اس کو نہیں بھولنا کہ کس لیے حضرت اکتس مسیح مہد علیہ السلام نے جیسا سلانہ کی جو ہے وہ بنیاد رکھی اور باقی ساری چیزیں تو چلتی رہیں گی لیکن وہ جو روحانیت میں ترقی کرنے والی بات ہے وہ ہمیشہ ہمیں پیش نظر رکھی Absolutely, with that said, of course, you can imagine this jilsa doesn't come up in a single day It takes quite a lot of effort by the various volunteers And so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break to watch the inspection and all those, you know, the setup that went involved behind the scenes Mubarak, 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 Mubarak Ye din ho Mubarak, Mubarak ho ye din Ye jalsa hamara, ye din barkat ho ke Khuda ki inayat aur shafat ho ke یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہ دن برکتوں کے خدا کی انایات اور شفقتوں کے یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہ دن ہو مبارک مبارک ہو یہ دن یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہ دن برکتوں کے خدا کی انایات اور شفقتوں کے یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہاں آسمانی گجر بج رہا ہے پلوں سے بلوری شجر سج رہا ہے نئے پھول ہر شاخ پر کھل رہے ہیں یہ جلسہ ہمارا یہ دن برکتوں کے خدا کی انایات اور شفقتوں کے یہ جلسہ ہمارا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakallah. Welcome back. As you know that in this Western world, a lot of people are getting sick of the attractions. In fact, very recently a Netflix uh, special came out about a minimalist lifestyle. As people are turning more and more towards a level of spirituality because they're yearning for something. And so keeping all of that in the back of our minds, we understand that people from all walks of life are looking for that. And we're blessed that here in Jalsa Salana, USA, you will see a wide array of people who are giving, you know, doing duties, all benefiting either duties or they're benefiting by participating in the Jalsa Salana. And so Alhamdulillah, I'm uh, blessed and, you know, Alhamdulillah, we're blessed to have our two um, guests here today to discuss a little bit more about the duties that we have. We are with Palauddin Shama Sahib and Bashir Malik Sahib. If you can kindly introduce a little bit about what departments and, you know, what you're overseeing and how much uh, some of that work is just behind the scenes, if you can introduce yourselves as well. Um, I'm currently serving <coughs> as the Afsar Jalsa Salana for this event. So there are several administrative departments that are under us. Uh, most importantly, the serving of the food to the uh, guests of Promise Musaya. In addition to that, transportation and accommodation of those guests sometimes. And, uh, 
uh, volunteer management and things like that, and regi uh, uh, registration is another thing. Sir. Chief Radhin Shams, so I don't have any particular, uh, uh, you know, department to, uh, to run in this. But case. generally, you're overseeing as the NAB of USA yeah, many of course, many things, yeah. of course, and uh, been involved in some of the meetings and the, stuff. The, very good. Exactly. So with that, I wanted to actually ask uh, some of your, your experiences in terms of the people. Again, we're looking at an audience that may be watching online that may not may have questions about, okay, well, it's USA Jalsa. Are they, you know, are they all middle class people working or are they different professions and different people? If you can share your experience on people who actually sign up and, and do duties, are they a wide array of occupations or otherwise? Well, I think that uh, uh, what I'd like to uh, start with is that uh, Ramul Messiah al-Islam's legacy is this Jalsa Salana. Uh, it's it's uh, interesting just to uh, kind of think back uh, in 1998, one of our 50th Jalsa, uh, I had the honor to speak at the Jalsa. I was the only person from USA Jamaat to speak, and my subject was uh, Jalsa Salana, the legacy of the Ramul Messiah. Oh, beautiful. So the legacy of the Ramul Messiah is not just <coughs> Salana's uh, organization or just to running or having a Jalsa Salana. But there are other two aspects to this also, which is his legacy. Number one is that serving the guests was his legacy. He was the one who would carry the dishes to the to the guests. His wife, Hazrat Amma Jan, uh, she, would, uh, she would be cooking the food in the initial years when there was no Langar Khana at that time. So that was a legacy, how to, how to serve the guests who have come from long distances. And it is how he took it as a personal obligation and responsibility to, to serve them. And the third one is to have the organization <coughs> that will serve through a volunteer system. Because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to say this, but the training of the volunteers becomes a huge task because you have people from different walks of life. You have physicians, you have uh, engineers, who have IT people. They are they're serving uh, food uh, to the guests. And they have no clue how to do that unless they're given training and guidance. And that's where, you know, the Afsal Jasa Salana's organization is important. The professional people who cook, they don't need much training. Sure. But when you are dealing with hundreds, and in, in some cases, uh, for example, in, in uh, the case of UK Jalsa, yeah. where Hazur is, yeah. uh, thousands it's, of it's, it's thousands of That's volunteers, right. Right. and they all have to be trained. And, and uh, so <coughs> everything goes smooth, uh, because uh, this, this is the huge legacy of our Jamaat. I, I remember an incident that happened in front of us uh, in the Marshall Island when one of our mayors visited America. If you can right. share that experience, when he went into the Langar Khana, and ask yeah. people to introduce themselves, if you can yeah. share that. Be good yeah, experience. I mean, yeah, he was, he was surprised to see uh, how different people from different ways of life. And, some of them uh, were doctors and so many other things. Yeah, he was and, surprised, and cutting was, onions. And they were serving uh, food and, <laughs> right. you know, the cleaning and stuff. Uh, uh, the other, uh, you know, another um, uh, incident that I can mention is that uh, um, there was some uh, guest who came from Brazil okay. with the Brazil's Amir Sahib. And uh, because I, I, I happen to know them, uh, and uh, in UK Jalsa. So one of the guests lost his uh, cell phone. And he was sure that 100% that it's lost now. It's I mean, it's, it, is, it cannot be recovered from 50,000, 45,000 people, you know. So Amir Sahib told him, and said, no, it will be recovered. Okay, we have volunteers and it will be turned over and you will get it. And the next day, he got his phone, <laughs> and, and he, to this day, he talks about it. He says, yeah. I, he says I cannot even imagine uh, in, in a big crowd like this where people have that kind of training, in, and it's part of it is spiritual training as well, that uh, people are not you know, there to, to steal things and, and, exactly. and not give it back. Uh, but there was a system in place where it will be turned over and uh, turned to the owner. Dr. <clears> Lafalasab, <throat> you mentioned that such a huge gathering cannot take place without the effort of the volunteers. Umsab Kalbi Jahai, Mutur Mamir Sahib ne apne jo muayna ka ki takreer thi, us mein zikr kiya ki is dafa bahut zyada volunteers jo ke pichle saalo mein itni tadaad nahi hoti, sirf khadamul ahmdiya ke 400 se zyada jo hai, wo raza kaar hain jo is saal jalse ke intadamat ko dekh rahe hain. To 
صاحب ہمیں بتائیں گے کہ اتنا بڑا انتظام جو ہے اس کے لیے اندازن کتنے جو رضاکار ہیں وہ آتے ہیں اور کب سے اس کی جو تیاری جو ہے وہ شروع ہو جاتی ہے تیاری تو دیکھیں تیاری کا تو یہ حساب ہے کہ ایک جلسہ ختم ہوتا ہے تو اگلے جلسے کا انتظام شروع ہو جاتا ہے کہ کیونکہ ہم جلسہ ایک ہال رینٹ کر کے کرتے ہیں ایک رائے پہ ایک جگہ ہم لیتے ہیں اس کے لیے تو ہمیں ان کے ساتھ سب سے پہلے تو اپنے پروگرام کو مطابقت دکھانی پڑتی ہے کہ وہ ہمیں کب یہ ہال کیونکہ ہماری بڑی خاص قسم خاص نویت کی ہماری ضروریات ہوتی ہیں آ کے والنٹیئر نے رضاکاروں نے بہت زیادہ کام کرنا ہوتا ہے تو اس لحاظ سے تیاری تو شروع ہو جاتی ہے آہستہ آہستہ پھر جب وہ تیاری زور پکڑتی ہے تو کم از کم تین چار ماہ پہلے سے پھر چیزوں کے آرڈر دینے پھر کہ جی گوشت کتنا آئے گا دالیں کتنی آئیں گی پھر کمرے کتنے ہم نے مختص کرنے ہیں رضاکاروں کے لیے اور دوسرے مہمانوں کے لیے پھر اب ایئرپورٹ یہاں سے اگرچہ ہیرس برگ میں ایئرپورٹ تو ہے لیکن زیادہ تر لوگ جو ہیں وہ یا تو بالٹی مور میں آتے ہیں یا پھر ورجینیا کے جو دو ایئرپورٹس ہیں وہاں پہ آتے ہیں تو وہاں سے کس راؤٹ سے ان کو مناسب طریقے پر لایا جا سکے تو یہ ساری چیزیں شروع ہو جاتی ہیں پھر جب یہ جگہ ہم کو ملتی ہے جلسہ تو ہمارا جمعہ ہفتہ اتوار ہوتا ہے لیکن ہمیں یہ منگل کو جگہ دیتے ہیں منگل کو جگہ دینے کا مطلب ہے کہ ہمارے پاس اس کا قبضہ ہوتا ہے اس لحاظ سے کہ ہم اپنے رضاکاروں کو لا کے تو کام کر سکتے ہیں لیکن جو دوسرے وینڈرز ہیں وہ ایک ویکنڈ پہلے سے یہاں پہ یہ جو آپ کو تمام پائپس اینڈ ریف نظر آتے ہیں پھر یہاں پہ جو کارپٹ پڑا ہوتا ہے پھر ساؤنڈ سسٹم جو لگایا جاتا ہے اس سارے کا انظام جو ہے اس کے لیے وہ پروفیشنل جو ہیں وہ آتے ہیں تو رضاکار جو ہیں وہ پھر منگل سے آنا شروع ہو جاتے ہیں تو اس لحاظ سے کافی بڑا آپریشن ہوتا ہے ملک صاحب کیوں آپ کو بھی شیئر کیونکہ میں بہت 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 Sure. A couple of years, sure. uh, thanks to COVID, sure. it, got, uh, it, it took off. Sure. Uh, before that, it was uh, conference calls, and before that, it was fax machines. So right. Well, how far do you have to communicate sometimes with your team, just to uh, give an idea to the audience online? Some of the members, uh, I mean, for example, a couple of people in my team are from LA Jamaat, right. which is 3,000 miles away. <laughs> right. And what, um, for example, our uh, naib of sort of IT is from Seattle Jamaat. Right. So when it's another 3,000 the other way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So the thing is that when you are holding conference calls, you have to make sure that the time zones... Uh, uh, So you have to be very considerate. There is only a small window. For example, if you hold at 9 p.m. Eastern time, then it's 6 p.m. over there. But you cannot go beyond 10 p.m. Eastern time That's during right. the weekdays. Right. So, so even the timing has to be right, adjusted. Right, right. Yeah. Can you also share a little bit about the theme? And I think both of you can maybe speak about it. But just the theme of this year's Jalsa and how it relates to you know the overall scheme of things. So. Well, it's the Holy Quran that... Uh, that is the last message of uh, Allah Ta'ala and uh, this is something that uh, has to be uh, brought out uh, as a subject matter for the for the general membership um, to remind them uh, my father had uh, in his in his last testament this was the first advice that he gave us he said that uh, this you got to read the Holy Quran every day and and <coughs> and as has promised Messiah Islam said that uh, this is his Kaaba so you have to keep on taking circuits around it and and just keep it in focus yeah. so that is I think the uh, attempt uh, for this Jalsa to uh, to bring out to the uh, just to kind of remind them I think all Ahmadis know uh, how uh, important uh, the, the kind of importance that Prophet Messiah Islam and his Khulafah have, have put on this thing I think uh, bo so, both of you have also experienced other Jalsas around the world what lessons could you take from them and what maybe you know that you have implemented maybe here in USA or or just what your experiences when you visit other Jalsas around the world 
Well, the th thing is that when you compare to other Western countries, Delsa, or even if you compare it to Ghana, where there are about 200,000 people show up, right. <laughs> uh, ours is a very uh, <laughs> humble, uh, I mean, 10,000 people, uh, people in UK or Germany would just cough at it. Like, oh, 10,000 <laughs> right. people, what's the big deal? <laughs> sure. I mean, they are, 40, they are expecting more than 50,000 people. Right. 30, year, 40, right? 50,000, so, right, right. <laughs> so we have our own set of problems. Um, for example, in UK, I mean, come on, UK is the size of New Jersey. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Over here, people are sure. coming from the whole continent. Right, it took us five-hour flight from LA, for example, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, different, challenge, different shades for, uh, for, of challenges for uh, every country. Um, they, I cannot, I wouldn't say that we have unique challenges. There are the food that you have to serve, the accommodation right. you have to provide. So, similar challenges, the volume is different. Is I different. think the uh, serving uh, in the in the justice, uh, even when I was a, a teenager in, in college and stuff, right. uh, I can remember that I've learned a lot of organizational skills from those Delsas, just, right. just because the duties that were assigned to us. I remember in a, in a meeting that, uh, you know, in Rava, there were no asphalt uh, right. streets in those oh, days. Oh, dirt roads, mm. right. So, so you had to water the streets to oh, keep the dirt okay, calm. Okay, okay, okay. So the, when they were, discussion came up that, okay, so now you have a tank of water that's going to be driving or, and sprinkler the, the, uh, the streets. So the... They did the calculations, and these were uh, really? math professors who did that. They said, look, in the beginning, the water pressure is going to be heavy because it's full, and it's going to throw more water. And then as, you're, as it's, it's uh, lowering the level of the water, it's, it's half side or quarter <laughs> side, now the sprinkler power is not there. So you have to change the speed of the truck at, really? at, with, in a certain uh, you know, fashion. Well, so, that much so detail it, planning. That much detail yeah. and planning, and uh, these are the kind of things that, that we thought about, uh, how a, in detail you, you had to figure it out uh, to make sure that they, it'll be smooth and it's yeah. uniform and all of that. Yeah. Uh, plus, um, the organization structure, you know, that, that they had, that, uh, you know, even uh, distribution of... Uh, uh, the food, uh, pre yeah. preparation of the food, sure. and all these departments were structured. And we as students, uh, this is not something we learned in, uh, in college. Right. You know, it was, it was on the job training. Right. So I think it's wonderful because I, I know that by experience that when I was, uh, uh, I was you know, uh, president of Chicago for many years, I knew that the people who were trained in those jalsas, they will be better organized for, for any job. Sure. Because they they automatically knew, right they, they yeah, will yeah. know how how to uh, arrange it how to organize it and and the job would be taken care of oh, so but the other people really you know <laughs> they, they were not trained for that. तो सब एक लिहाज से ये जलसा सलाना गुजरता सालों से मुख्तलिफ है इसको ये है कि पिछले दो चार साल में कोविड की वजह से बास पाबंदियां थी तादाद भी महदूद थी और भी बास पाबंदियां थी तो इस साल वो पाबंदियां तो नहीं हैं तो इस लिहाज से मुख्तलिफ होगा तादाद भी ज्यादा होगी तो और किस तरह जलसा सालाना ये दो हजार तेईस वाला जो है गुजशत सालों से मुख्तल आप हमारी नाजरन के लिए अगर बता सकें तो जब हमने इसकी मनसूबाबंदी करना शुरू की तो हमने कहा कि पिछले सालों में जो दो हजार उन्नीस का जलसा था उसमें दस हजार की हाजिरी थी हमारे जलसे पे तो हमने कहा कि अब वैसे तो हमें नहीं पता कि कितने लोग आ जाएंगे लेकिन हमने कहा कि बारह हजार एक अच्छा नंबर है उस लिहाज से कि अगर दस फीसद या बीस फीसद इजाफा होता है क्योंकि बहुत सारे लोग जो अगरचे पिछले साल भी जलसा हुआ था लेकिन वो जलसा जो था वो फिर भी कोविड के दौरान था जलसा और उसमें भी बहुत सारी पाबंदियां थी कि जी आपको वैक्सीन लगा होना चाहिए और अगर वैक्सीन नहीं लगा हुआ तो यहाँ पे आपका टेस्ट होगा और आप लोगों को वैसे भी तरद था कि भाई पता नहीं वहाँ पे जा के ना मैं बीमार हो जाऊँ तो वो अल्लाह ताला ने वो तो फजल किया है अब कि दुनिया से उस बीमारी को कम से कम इस हद तक वो रहेगी तो सही बीमारी है अब यहाँ पे वायरस तो अब आ गया वो तो रहेगा लेकिन ये कि वो अब एक लिहाज से इस लिहाज से वो एक कंट्रोल में है कि हाँ ठीक है जी बड़ी गैदरिंग में वो नहीं होगा तो 
اس لئے آپ سے دیکھیں اللہ تعالیٰ فضل کرے کتنے لوگ آتے ہیں Today just looking at Jumma, it looked like a lot more people, Alhamdulillah, have come today. So Alhamdulillah, it's good to see that. Our experience has been that Saturday is the busiest day because many people who are here for Jumma, obviously they are going to stay, but then many people who for some one reason or the other either could not take off or they live at a distance where by the time they would come here, it would be later in the day and then they would say at least let me attend Saturday. So Saturday is the busiest day for us. So we'll see you know, how it goes tomorrow. Very good, very good. What are some challenges that you feel um, come in this, this organizational aspect? Just something that comes to your mind that was one of, one of the bigger challenges that you had to face. The this biggest challenge year. this year which is faced by anyone and everyone in the world is the inflation. So anything that was, let's say, $100 in 2019 is now $125 and $30. I mean, cost of eggs and bread and even basic items like butter have gone up. And that adds to the cost. Uh, these, peop these vendors who provide us all these uh, exposition, these decorations and all these dividers and all that, they have also increased their prices. So the cost is a very big factor this year. So Ali Shamsab, you know, we're seeing here the 73rd, but I believe you've also experienced the first of a Jalsa in the Marshall Island, for example. If you yeah. could share that experience as well for the, yeah. you know, for the online viewers as well. I also experienced the, uh, the first Jalsa when uh, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, the four, uh, uh, went to London, and that, that was the first Jalsa Beautiful. with him. So even if you can share so both I was of there, yeah, in Marshall Island, also attended the the first and second Jalsa. And uh, it, it really was remarkable uh, how it had affected the people. Right. Uh, the uh, ambassador to U.S., you know, uh, he mentioned to me, because we had him, uh, he attended the, uh, the second Jalsa. In the first one, he had sent a representative, but because uh, he was out of the country. But then uh, the second one, and when we had children reciting the uh, Arabic uh, Qasida of the Prophet Messiah he, he, he mentioned to me, he was sitting next to me, and he, sa he said, you know, I cannot believe that people uh, who have no knowledge of this language and so remote, how they so far away, it, right. and, and, and so many of them, yeah, it was yeah, not yeah, just yeah. one or two, yeah, sure. it was a group of, uh, you know, like six or eight yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Stu uh, people that we had. Speaking of various Jalsa Salana, as Azhar Hanifsa mentioned in his khutbah today that uh, there are countries which are unable to hold Jalsa, right. for example, right. Pakistan has been 40 years since they had any kind of Jalsa, so we are lucky and blessed and thankful to Allah Ta'ala that we are living in these countries and able right. to take part in these Jalsa yeah. Salanas. One time I was visiting Rabba and, uh, the, you know, I was visiting uh, one of the, uh, you know, vakils at uh, Tariq Ajadi's office and he said that he has to, he had to go. So I said, where are you going? And he says that uh, we have uh, 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 a test run at the Daru Ziyafat, uh, how to prepare for Jalsa. <clears throat> and he says, you know, he says what it is that you probably don't think about this thing, but we have people who are 25, 26 years old, and they have never seen a jalsa. They have no idea or concept sure. uh, of how it's, it's arranged and how it's managed, how it's run. And he says, so we want to keep on uh, training them and, and making course. sure and in other countries as well, like Bangladesh has exactly, it. You know, someone exactly. even here, right. we see younger people. Who right. are literally doing duties that, like you said, when they get right. that training here under Khudam Lam or right. otherwise. Right. And actually, I wanted to ask Malik Sahib as well, mm -hmm. how do we really drive some of that, the, 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 you know, the power of service, even here in America? You know, how do you see, you know, Khudam are signing up and setting, you know, coming forward and young people and so, even on the lady side, you know, there's, there's yeah. a great drive to see all that. So, so it's interesting you ask that because last night when Amir Sahib was doing inspection, he stopped at the registration desk and there was this eight-year-old kid there and Hazur Amir Sahib asked him, what motivated you? He said, well, my friends were doing it, so I thought I would do it too. So peer, peer pressure is, yeah. uh, this is a peer pressure in a positive in a positive, right, exactly. Positive so, peer pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he said, so he said, didn't your parents ask you to do it? No, they didn't ask me. I, I, I told that my friends are doing it, so I'm 
He said, do you know what you are doing? Yes, I am doing registration. Do you need a badge or something? That's great. That's great. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, we will be back after a short break and then we'll be going to the Jalsa guys. Jazakallah. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, once stated, We are a witness and testify before the whole world that we have found in the Holy Quran the reality that leads to God. We have heard the voice of God and have witnessed the signs of the mighty arm of him who has revealed the Quran. We believe that he is the true God and is the master of the worlds. Our heart is filled with this certainty as the ocean is filled with water. We therefore invite everyone to this faith and to this light on the basis of enlightened perception. We have found the true light which dispels all darkness and which really renders the heart cold to all that is beside God. This is the only way by following which a person emerges from the grip of passion and the darkness of the ego as a snake sloughs off its skin. Kitab al Bariya, Ruhani Khazain, Volume 13, page 65. Jamal Hussain. Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, Ayyazawullah Ta'ala bin Masih Aziz, once stated that the root cause of the unrest in, in the world today is due to lack of justice found in every level of the society. So when we look at the Holy Quran, Holy Quran talks about different societal ills. And as I mentioned, first is the, the justice that we see in the world today because of lack of justice. Uh, we see that there is chaos and disorder. The Holy Quran uh, emphasizes on this, that we need to be firm on justice. Whether we talk about gender inequality or religious intolerance, or in today's world, we see that nowadays uh, there is an opioid crisis, of uh, fake news, and many other things. So the Holy Quran gives the answer to all these uh, societal ills. And Holy Quran prohibits each one of us that not to follow uh, the footsteps of those people who have done all these wrong wrong things. During the time of Holy Prophet peace be upon him, those people who were ignorant and all these societal ills, uh, they were practicing these things. And the, through the Holy Quran, they were able to transform themselves by following these commandments and by following these prohibition from God Almighty. And when they stopped doing those, those things, then they were able to transform themselves. Ye jalsa hamara, ye din barkaton ke. Essentially, the jalsa provides a safe space to press pause, come, enjoy these speeches about brotherhood about peace, about our community that we need, that we need to hear because everything's moving so fast. So many different things are being talked about in the American society and we need to have that area where we can safely learn what we actually have been taught. Chelsea for me has always been an experience I would say of labor, you know, ever since I was small, the basic duties were, it started off delivering water, you know, all the young and small would run around and, you know, you'd have the pitchers and the cups and you'd provide that to the elderly sitting on the chairs and in the crowd. And then, you know, you get upgraded to bathroom cleaning duties, get to use the tools. And now eventually, you know, 
you get the more adult roles and you but you're still providing a labor you're providing service to the guests of the promised Messiah Allah Salaam Jazakallah again, thank you for coming back. So what we're gonna do now is inshallah ta'ala is we're gonna go outside and you know I came into the registration, it was hot. And so I want to go ahead and hear from our uh, our hosts outside who are gonna interview some folks as well and get the feel for what the work is going on. Muhammad Amachari Sab, you are there and Salam Bharti Sab, I believe are both there. How are you guys doing out there? Okay, maybe they're not ready yet, but we'll get back to them soon, inshallah ta'ala. So the idea again is that, mashallah, there's a lot of duties, a lot of people are scattered, some are inside with air condition, a lot of them are outside um, in the heat. And so, Bali Sahib, you can imagine how hard it is. It's very humid outside, and East Coast weather is very different. And so share a little bit about, you know, how did it feel when you parked your car and came inside, the vibes and, and the feelings. <laughs> so Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-Imran Jami'an is a love which is uh, to me of utmost importance here because Allah Ta'ala says that we want to hold on to the rope of Allah Ta'ala collectively as a group. So spirituality cannot be achieved all by ourselves. What Allah Ta'ala wants us to do is to come together as a united uh, group and hold on to the rope of Allah Ta'ala all together. So to me, if I need to you know, spiritually uplift myself and I want to strengthen my connection with Allah Ta'ala and, and enhance my spirituality, I need to do that in a, in, in, in a group. Uh, and that's what Jalsa provides me. When I come here, I, I kind of, the energy uh, I receive around me really, you know, uh, gets me going further. And, and doing congregational salat and listening to speeches and, and seeing all uh, brothers around me focused on the same purpose as I am in those three days uh, strengthens my spirituality. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, once stated, I wish to convey it to everyone that the Holy Qur'an is the book which fulfills all these needs. Through it, a person is drawn to God and his heart grows cold to the love of the world. For those who follow it, God, who is hidden beyond the hidden, in the end manifests himself and displays those powers of which outsiders have no notion, and informs of his existence by the affirmation, I am present. Chashmai Marfat, Ruhani Khazain, Volume 23, Pages 305 to 309. 
You know, the, the Holy Quran is a mercy for us from Allah Almighty. And Allah knew all of the challenges that we were going to face, all of the difficulties that we were going to go through, no matter what financial difficulties, societal difficulties, moral difficulties, any possible situation that we can be placed in, any possible difficulty, Allah has mentioned all those in the Holy Quran in His, more, in his, in his own unique and, uh, and eloquent way. And if we dive deep into it, if we maintain a consistent relationship, then we will see that Allah Almighty is speaking to us in all of these different situations of life that we go through. So if we remain regular with the Holy Quran, we will see how Allah Almighty was aware of all the things individually we were going to face and as a people, as a nation, as a world that we were going to face as well. And He's given us the guidance in there of what to do in those situations. Alaikum. Again, I'm inside. Nice, cool weather, but we have a salam barti sab outside. Please tell us how it is outside. What's going on? We're just wondering. We're trying to get through, inshallah, to the outside folks who salam barti sab and Muhammad Ahmed Chaudhry sab. We're having some technical difficulties, but you know, it's it's how we get through it. This is part of the experience, inshallah. So jazakallah again. We also have Bali sab here as well, by the way, <laughs> so he can also share some thoughts while we're getting this set up, inshallah. Oh, we're about to get ready, I think. <laughs> it's a good experience for all of us. Thank you for the audience as well. Somebody stop, please. Tell us how it's outside. We're... And dear viewers, assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. We are here outside the Jalsaqa. The flags are behind us in preparation for flag hoisting. Just as you can join the Jalsa through social media while also watching this, we've had other guests coming and participating in Jalsa in a different way this year. I'm joined uh, by Dawud Chakra Saab and uh, uh, Sarma Tzadiki Saab who came on their bicycle to Jalsa. Assalamu alaikum, gentlemen. Thank you. So uh, tell us, what was the motivation for coming on bike? It all started with uh, our delivery line where we used to see Thomas' uh, emphasis to ride long distance bicycles, uh, especially just in these little little parts. That's where we have a... Uh, he mentioned this to the Marches and Sarah now or in general? I think in general, but okay. particularly in Marches and Sarah. So uh, that's where our... Uh, that's what basically what he But I'm amazed to know from the people who see Salas has also said uh, he would desire a life to, I'm paraphrasing it, like people who do 100 miles a day. That's great. So that's why our century thing is coming along. That's great. Okay, so we see them with their equipment today, but let's see them in action uh, via this uh, short video. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, Usman Ahmad, South Berlin's of Vermont. Assalamu alaikum, Dawood Chata from Maryland. Assalamu alaikum, Zahir Ahmad from New Jersey. Sermad from uh, Maryland. Maryland are here under the auspicious guidance of Zuri Anwar and uh, saying look back to his uh, desire to come to Jalsa Salana, which is 73rd U.S. in Jalsa Salana. Majlis and Sarullah! Maryland, USA! Badam Doseto! Wow, that was a great video you saw uh, of them entering. What a grand entrance you guys made, you know, after riding over 100 miles. I don't know if I could do 10. Uh, Sarmat Sab, how do you prepare for a century ride, a hundred mile ride. How often do you have to train? How long do you have to train? Can I start doing this soon? Anybody can do this. Uh, in fact, we we didn't start that long ourselves. So you start slow, you start with five miles, 10 miles, and slowly you build your mileage. And and to do 100 miles, basically all it is that there's a routine. You gotta do it every, every regular interval. 
do a 30 mile here, 30 mile there, and eventually next time you'll find yourself doing 60 miles and then you're 100. So 30 miles is, is the base? Is that is that the first milestone we should be looking for for yes. all of us to join you next year? For sure, yeah. I think that that's what people should be aiming for is to get into 30 miles. Because 30 miles is about two hours uh, if you do 50 miles, uh, 50 miles per hour. Okay. So, so you're looking at two hours and two two hours of exercise every other day is more than that. So I'm talking about other countries do this as well, or is the U.S. the first? We've heard and we've seen always the Germans coming to UK jobs uh, on their bicycles. So what's next, Dr. Self? Are we I'm thinking of Germany? I'm glad you mentioned Germany, but this is thought we are already preparing for it and we already booked for uh, Germany to uh, so like, go. so like, go. from going from Auckland this video to London to participate in UK Jobs Fest this year. And uh, we both are going, there are four other people that are committed to this. Yeah, so for that, uh, it's a blessed journey, as you are mentioning it, it's long, it's in four days, in executive, 90 miles, 90 miles, 80, no, some other distance. Wait, wait. So that would be fun, a very blessed trip we're looking up to. So how many miles was this trip? 113 miles. And how many miles is that trip? That's about uh, 90, 90, 80, 60, depending on the... Uh, uh, about two days. Oh, so, wow. So, 350 miles. Oh, 350 okay. miles in four days. Yeah. MashaAllah. Oh, well, good luck, gentlemen. And so I'll be with you on that journey. Yes. Hopefully, this was good warm up, yes. good practice. But this is a lesson initiated you, for. You know, this, oh. this is great. Thank you for the time. We're going to come back to the studio. This is our cycling team. Hopefully, it grows and grows uh, over the time. Uh, so, and now back to the studio to Kosar Saab and Adam Saab. Assalamu alaikum, Jazakallah. Thank you so much. What an amazing experience. I really appreciate it. That's good that you've shared all that stuff. So, the idea again is that Alhamdulillah, Bali Sahib, we got to see this amazing, you know, scenes from outside. It's hot. The, the cyclists, they've come all the way here. Amazing experience. And as you can imagine, we know we're going to get further and further into what we're doing. So, share a little bit of your thoughts on, on what's happening today and, and, you know, maybe whatever you're feeling as well for our audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what we're going to have to do is that uh, again, it's it's beautiful as you mentioned. The cyclists have come from far off. So many other people have come, whether they're flying. I myself flew all the way from Los Angeles, 3,000 miles. And so, again, that's the beauty of this Jalsa Salana here in the United States, that we're, we're seeing you know, people travel far and wide just to be here. And again, many of you are joining in live from, from vast places, from far off lands. There's territory, there's you know, members who are living in Guam, that even further than Los Angeles. There's others who are living in Hawaii and so many other places, Puerto Rico, islands and territories, there's waters, there's mountainous ranges, there's valleys. There's so many things that separate us, and yet it's Khilafah that brings us together. And that's the beauty of it being today. Because again, as we, you know, we all started our day this morning with the Friday Sermon of Beloved Hazur. That's really how you kind of gear towards you know, coming to Jalsa Salaam on a Friday. Some of us in the East Coast may have woken up around 8 a.m. to be able to listen to the Friday sermon. But in the West Coast, even at 5 a.m., they will have to listen. To, that's when they listen to the Friday sermon. And that's how you know, you know, vast and how many timelines you have to cross over just to experience this jalsa. And so, so many of us flew the night before, an all-night flight. It's called the red-eye flight. We arrived here early in the morning, got ready, headed straight to Jalsa Salana after listening to the sermon of Beloved Hazur. And again, it's so powerful because whatever meager you know, efforts that we make, we look at and we hear from Beloved Hazur, the Sahaba's sacrifices, the sacrifices that they have made, the sacrifices that our Master Prophet Muhammad wasallam made, it is absolutely amazing. But Lisa, you know, just when you hear Beloved Hazur speak about these things, we're even more humbled, absolutely. right? About what, what, how insignificant our efforts are in this day and age. Cool. You know? Absolutely. 
وہ لوگ آتے ہیں اور امریکہ جماعت جو ہے وہ کئی اور سٹیٹس اور ٹیریٹوریز کو بھی دیکھ رہی ہے جس میں کہ جماعت امجی امریکہ کے تحت مبلغین تبلیغ کی ذمہ داریاں جہاں سر انجام دے رہے ہیں مثلا پورٹوریکو ہو گیا اسی طرح مارشل آئل میں جہاں آپ رہے ہیں وہ یہ گوام سے تو سارے لوگ اس وقت بھی ہمارے ساتھ شامل ہیں جس سلسلانہ کی نشریات سے جو ہیں وہ استفادہ کر رہے ہیں تو ہم امید کرتے ہیں کہ آپ بھرپور رنگ سے مستفید ہو رہے ہیں ملی صاحب نیکس کیا آنے والا ہے ابھی نیکس لائیو ہم جانے لگیں we're about to go live what's next coming up جی ابھی جو ہے پرچم کشائی کی تقریب ہوگی جو کہ ہم آپ کو باہر لے جائیں گے جہاں سے لائیو آپ وہ ٹرانسمیشن جو ہے وہ دیکھ سکیں گے کسی بھی قوم جو ہے اس کے لیے اس کا جو پرچم ہوتا ہے بڑی اہمیت کا حامل ہوتا ہے اس کے لیے جان بھی لوگ قربان کرنے کے لیے تیار ہو جاتے ہیں اور حضور انور عید اللہ تعالیٰ بن عصر عزیز نے گزشتہ کچھ خطبات میں اس بات کا ذکر بھی کیا کہ کیسے بعض صحابہ جو تھے جن کی یہ ذمہ داری تھی کہ وہ جو اسلام کا پرچم تھا اس کو سر بلند رکھے ان میں سے اگر کسی کا ایک بازو کٹ گیا تو اس نے دوسرے بازو سے جا پکڑنے کوشش کی منہ سے جو ہے وہ پکڑنے کوشش کی کہ جو اسلام کا جھنڈا ہے وہ نیچے نہ گرنے پڑے تو لوائے احمدیت بھی اسی طرح پر اسی انہی مقاصد کے پیش نظر ہے کہ ہمیں احساس ہو ہماری کیا ذمہ داری ہیں اس کو سر بلند رکھنے کے لیے اور اس کو ہمیشہ اونچا ہی اڑانے کے لیے ہم سب کی ایک ذمہ داری ہے جو کہ ہم ادا کرتے ہیں It's a beautiful again to have this experience because, you know, as you can imagine, in every country, by the grace and mercy of Allah, wherever Ahmadiyya, the seed of Ahmadiyya is planted, there the flag of Ahmadiyya also is raised. And that is again part of these, you know, this Jalsa proceeding. It begins with the flag hoisting after, of course, the Jummah prayer. And that is again something we're going to experience today. It's so beautiful. It's very, you know, it's, it's very powerful to see. Especially in a country where each state has its own flag. Absolutely. You know, so even then, you know, there's so many flags, but, you know, you see the flag of Ahmadiyyad go up. And imagine again, you know, many of our audience may not know this, especially watching online. You don't get to see when you're walking through registration, you see those khudam standing in the heat. But Amir Saab is arriving now. We'll go ahead and take you outside to see those scenes as well. Jazakallah. Shortly uh, is uh, Amir Saab and a few others who are going to raise the three flags. Now the flags have quite a, mount, uh, a significant uh, history within Islam, as you just heard uh, from our uh, dear studio hosts. But within Islamic history, we also see during the Battle of the Qud, one of the companions, Hazrat Musab bin Umair, he was carrying the flag into battle. And while he was carrying the flag, one of his hands was cut off. And before the flag could hit the ground, he grabbed it with his other hand. When uh, he was holding you with the other hand, uh, his other hand...
coming. सब नूरों से अजला The Promised Messiah السلام, once stated, I say truly that if souls were inspired by true search and hearts felt true thirst, people would look for this way and would search for it. I assure the seekers that Islam alone gives the good news of this way, for other people have since long sealed up the possibility of revelation. Be sure that this seal is not set by God, but as man has deprived himself of this favor, he seeks excuses for its absence. As it is not possible that we should be able to see without eyes, hear without ears, or speak without a tongue, in the same way, it is not possible that we should be able to behold the countenance of the sweet beloved without the Holy Qur'an. I was young and am now old, but I have found no one who might have drunk of this clear understanding without this holy fountain. The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam, Ruhani Khazain, Volume 10, pages 443. Sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and Blessings of Allah be upon him. Al Mahiru bil Qur'ani ma'as safaratil kiramil barara. والذي يقرأ القرآن ويتتعتع فيه وهو عليه شاق له أجران. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, stated, One who is skilled in the recitation of the Holy Quran is associated with the noble, upright, recording angels. And he who falters when he recites the Quran and finds it difficult for him will have a double reward. Welcome again, our dear viewers, to another part of an experience of Jalsa Salana USA. For this segment, I have um, three guests with me who are members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in the United States of America. I'll introduce them first. But I'm your host, Abdullah Diba, and I'm a missionary. Uh, on my immediate left, I have Brother Busir Rodney, who has served in many capacities in uh, the USA Jamaat, but currently one of the positions he has is uh, president of the Pan-African Ahmadiyya Muslim Association, USA. Welcome, sir. And then right next to him uh, is a very common face, uh, Ibrahim Naeem Sahib. Uh, flew in from LA, for those who may not know, LA is very far from this side of the country. Uh, it's good to have Ibrahim Naeem it's Sahib. It's my pleasure. And then my third guest on my far left is um, Brother Rafiq Friend, who uh, is from Philadelphia. He has been holding offices in local Jamaat as well as in Parma. So in this segment, we'll be talking about the Pan-African Ahmadiyya Muslim Association for the Basir Rodney Sahib yourself. You're serving as president of that association. Tell us a little about what is Palma for those who are hearing it for the first time. Well, Jazakallah for having us, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, the Pan-African Ahmadiyya Muslim Association uh, was uh, created by Khalifa Masih IV, Ramat al uh, and Khalifa Masih V, Hazrat uh, Masroor Ahmad, uh, authorized this establishment here in the United States in 
2017. Uh, the aim of PAMA, uh, as we sometimes call it, uh, is to unite, uh, empower, um, and educate Africans, uh, uh, Muslims, Ahmadiyya Muslims as well as African, uh, other Africans, to serve Africa, the, the, uh, the society in which we live, and our faith, which is Islam. And so that's, you know, uh, uh, PAMA in a nutshell. So it's a broad mission, of course, but attached to it deeply, for example, is uh, attaching uh, our own PAMA members across the country into a united whole so we connect with Jamaat. Mm -hmm. um, we have particular interests, particular language groups. PAMA members range from the Caribbean, like myself, as well as North Africa, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. And so that diversity, uh, we want to make sure it feels at home in the Jamaat and is connected to Jamaat, com connected to Kalapa. And so we have different projects that we work on by the grace of Allah and through this, the, the, the aspirations of Khalif to Masih mm. to bring this community together. It's, it's one of the beauties of Justice Salana as well, Brother Ibrahim Naim. You see people of different origins uh, that come together. So this, for me at least, seeing those faces and seeing Palmer represented, what do you, what does it make you feel? You've been in the Jamaat for a long time, but seeing brothers of these different uh, descents coming here for Jalsa, what's your experience been like? Sheer joy, sheer joy. It is so good to see different friends that, that you've known over the years, different people you have met from different countries who have different uh, ethnicities, who have different uh, uh, points of view and different histories, and we all come together under the banner of Islam Ahmadiyya, and it's just such a joyous occasion. So uh, it's a thrill to be here. Alhamdulillah. And again, we're, we, we're all in America, but uh, the representation is very diverse. And that, that significance is what we try to highlight when we are beginning the Jalsa proceedings. And that's through the flag hoisting, which will be coming to you very soon. So, so, so sit tight. But uh, yeah, sure. Because this year I had a particular joy before coming. I didn't know, was this like internal? And then I started thinking about, you know, the whole of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. the opportunity. Many people that are within our community, they kind of leave off, don't appreciate the value and what this is, this little break we get. But we come to do all this fellowship with brothers and, you know, our children and, That's right. you know, hear amazing things. So it was just very exciting this year. And, and again, coming in spirit, the spirit that we come in, that's what makes it. But, but it was here. Um, President Saab of Palma, I'll come to you again. You talked about how Palma started with the fourth Khalifa, um, but we see that it's been growing. It's been in the UK for a long time, now in USA 2017, and it's growing. It's going into other countries. What do you think is Khalifa al Misi's vision? Because his stamp is all over this, his instruction. What do you think, as President, what have you heard, or do you know is, is his vision? Well, well, Alhamdulillah, you know, um, the beauty of Khilafat, um, especially in this time, where we're seeing lots of challenges with issues like justice, um, you know, in our society, we call it social justice. But Khalifa Masi has said that we should think about it in the context of the supremacy of justice. Khalifa mm. uh, Masi, Rabbi used to say, the absolute justice, a, a kind of recognition that justice is not just looking after your own rights, mm. but also looking after the rights of others. And even as you pursue your own rights, you pursue your own rights with the interest of the other also intact. Uh, and as as African people, we are acutely connected to the reality that the world is sometimes very unjust. Mm. And so I think Khalifa Masih's vision is to position uh, our Pan-African Ahmadiyya Muslim Association at the forefront of this idea of what the supremacy of justice is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To show that faith is, a, is an important factor in justice and to also show that unity is an important factor in justice. Not just a lot of what we see in the society, this splintering and this kind of strife. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Khalifa Masih is positioning Palma in these different countries. And I mean, it's funny you should say that because we're here talking in the United States. When, it, when, when Palma's developed and set up in the United States, before some of the real deep racial divisions that threw up to the top in the last five or six years. Mm. Belgium, France, right? Palma's being positioned in these places. And then last week we saw, you know, Paris going up in flames in part because of the same justice issues, right? Mm. So all over the world you see these as if Khalifa Masih has has kind of Both seen yeah. Yeah. ahead and said, yes. look, these things are coming. So let the, the the Ahmadis be at the center of that, the front of that. And since many of those issues affect, mm. again, power members, yeah, right? Khalifa Masih saying, no, you are empowered to then go forward. 
and show people what real unity is. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. as you talk about, I mean, think about it. We're talking about that from a place like mm -hmm. Joseph Solana, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you're showing people what real unity is. This is how yeah. people really come together. Absolutely. Right? Not in these other things that you see out in the society. So I think that's a blessing of Bluff to show the world Absolutely. that kind of quality. Beautiful. So, Brother Ibrahim Naeem, you know, we have Ahmadi Doctors Association, we have all these other associations. What do you think is important for that? But Basira said, Khalifa Thomas is empowering Hama members to take this lead. Why is it important for not somebody else to do it, but for our own membership to do it? How important is that? I think I think it's important because uh, I, you know we all have our specific niche. We have an area that is most dear to us. We have an area where we have a greater effect. And I think this is the wisdom of Khilafat that he is pointing out that you, I'm, we have to address all of these specific areas, yeah. but the right person, the right people must be the ones who are the vanguard in making that address, specifically for the purpose of uh, advancing justice. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the whole purpose that, you know, you are not sit, don't send me to China. You know, I'm ineffective. You know, let me talk to the people with whom I have a common history and common desires. And so this, I think, is the wisdom of that. Absolutely. And it's the beauty of one of the arms of Khilafah is the yeah. yeah, power. Actually, you know, in the end, you know, when Azor first took his position, he told us to go to talk to our own people. People got a little upset about that when he said it. He said, um, go find it and talk to your people. So he was always clear about what the agenda was. We just catch it <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure the viewers are hearing the, the announcements in the background. Jalsa is about to start. The build-up is happening. People are going to the Jalsa guy. But I want to end up with Brother Rafi. You could tell us a little bit about service, right? Because Palma also includes serving our communities and serving the general. Give me a, a little glimpse of what are some of the services that Palma has offered. I'll give you one that was pretty important um, at a time when there was a health crisis. When the uh, pandemic was flourishing, um, Papa was right to the forefront. He had called the membership up. Along with Dr. Ayla Saxton, she was the head of the Black Doctors Association. And she had got these young doctors and nurses together. And they came out to the mosque and they set up their uh, gear. And they tested people riding the car, walk ins. Papa membership was there. Papa membership was there. I remember she was there up front uh, handling her business. So that was just like one aspect of what we do. But mm -hmm. of course, you know, we're very involved with uh, food distribution and things of that nature. But that was the big thing. Absolutely. That, that's beautiful to see. And Brother Basir, I'm sure if I was to ask you, there's a lot of other Oh, yeah, objectives. absolutely. Um, you know, so Palma's done a lot of internal work on itself because mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of the mission. Mm -hmm. um, making sure our, our Palma members feel at home. Many are. Um, Born Ahmadis, some are transports. Uh, so we want to feel like a cohesive whole. Some of our service in that regard involve making sure that the education of Palma members is high. Khalif Tomasi has taken um, a real interest in that. So we have a scholarship program that's been going for years. Um, we have some main scholarships that we try to make sure Palma members are getting into schools and colleges and advanced programming. Um, and also making sure that they're not getting tied down with student loans and all these kinds of uh, these challenges we have in the West. Uh, Palma is also very active, our ladies are especially are very active mm -hmm. in service programs from school supplies. Um, coming up in August, there's always school supplies for the kids in our neighborhoods, Beautiful. making sure that they have resources to go to school with and feel comfortable. Uh, Palma members have been, we're, we've been working on a project right now with Humanity First. We're doing some volunteering to do some tutoring of uh, some kids, some of which are actually in the Caribbean, so we're working on that. Palma leverage leveraged that. Um, we have so many social programs. We just did another program um, with the Ahmadiyya Muslim Medical Association uh, where we talk about Palma members as well as non Palma members who are interested to just talk about how to navigate healthcare here in the United States. Because yeah, healthcare can be so challenging sometimes. It can, definitely. And sometimes as people age, it's challenging. So our, our, our Ahmadiyya Muslim doctors came out. We were on a webinar together. We talked about some of these issues of mm. how to navigate and access care. Yeah. So we look for opportunities like that. 
um, to leverage even other parts of the Jamaat as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, because again, we are one Jamaat. Yeah. And so that we, but we can uniquely, as Pan African Amity Muslim Association, connect with this group of high functioning doctors, right? And we can find these really interesting and impressive awesome. lawyers. And, yeah, yeah, and we yeah. can bring them together and then bring them in service of. Uh, right. communities that yeah. are sometimes disempowered, right? Because that's so, one of the challenges in the United States. Sometimes, and Ibrahim names have you've been in the education sector for a long time, being a professor yourself. I've, I've since I moved here, I've seen that in the communities we've worked in Philadelphia. There's many resources, but sometimes people don't have access to them. So, so tell us a little about education and the need for access to education in America, especially in the neighborhoods that are struggling. How do you see that Palma could fit in there, which is already doing? Well, the need is critical, particularly now after the uh, pandemic. If you look at the, the scores and the, the, the terrible drop in performance subsequent to the, the uh, students being away from actual classroom attendance, it is very, uh, very disturbing. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to focus on coming up with some unique ways to, uh, to address that. The schools are, are still struggling. Unfortunately, they, in many communities, those schools are tending to spend their time uh, addressing issues that aren't really issues, yeah. Uh, yeah. rather than looking at uh, getting to the nitty gritty. So, uh, inshallah, I think we will be able to do more yeah. to support students more directly to find those opportunities to develop programs that are going to address those particular student learning gaps in, uh, in, in the short term. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. on the longer term, yeah, maybe it's, to it's, it's excellent. It's excellent we have uh, the right group here, two professors, <laughs> and, and you work in the justice system. But I, yes. I was going to ask you quickly about, about Khalifa Tomasi's visit. You were in Philadelphia, the mayor came, and a lot of people came, and across the country, right? And Huzur recently came, last year as well. How does that boost us as a community, Palma, the Jamaat generally? What do we learn from Huzur's visits when he comes, especially? Well, Huzur said, come to fight your tears. He said, wipe your tears. That's the one remarkable thing that he said that resonates with me, is that he's so connected to the community, you know, and uh, what his vision was for the community. It wasn't so much about our community, it was for the community. Mm -hmm. And he said, your goal, objective is to wipe their tears. Mm -hmm. And the lady came out from that and she was said, who says that? She mm -hmm. was interviewed. Mm -hmm. She said, who says that? Yeah. She was an African-American woman. So that's kind of like what the agenda is. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you for sure, I was supercharged. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> I was on fire. And things before the pandemic, we were, you know, getting some nice things done. Work with Temple University and... Uh, I uh, had the town watch going, and you that's, that's, know that's we were doing some nice in the city of Philadelphia, yeah, you know that. stuff yeah. that we were doing. But you know, uh, it really gives you a shot. Oh, whenever you get around to Cleveland. It and does. So I, I go to UK and yeah. and, and, and I think shot. and I think we can all shot. and I think we can all connect with that because you know Khilafat is what unites us all together. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah, gentlemen, for your time and for enlightening us and educating us. Exactly. But um, dear viewers, that's all that we had for this segment. I'll now pass you on to the. The real, inshallah, just a session to begin officially after the Juma, and then after that we have more exciting programs coming for you uh, from the studio here and other places around the uh, Jalsa Gah as well. When I see you again, salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. If we see uh, that how the Holy Quran transforms uh, people individually or collectively, Assalamu alaikum. We start the session with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Salman Tariq Sahib. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'uzu billahi minash shaytan Bismillah 
is by Abdul Rahim Latif Sahib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The following is the English translation of the just recited verses from Surah Al Momin, chapter 40, verses 1 through 10. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. ha me. The revelation of the book is from Allah, the mighty, the all-knowing, the forgiver of sin and the acceptor of repentance, severe in punishment, the possessor of bounty. There is no God but he. Towards him is the final return. None disputes about the signs of Allah except those who disbelieve. Let not then their going about in the land deceive thee. The people of Noah and other groups after them denied our signs before these people, and every nation strove to seize their messenger and disputed by means of false arguments that they may rebut the truth thereby. <clears throat> then I seized them, and how terrible was my retribution. Thus was the word of thy Lord proved true against the disbelievers, that they are the inmates of the fire. Those who bear the throne and those who are around it glorify their Lord with his praise and believe in him and ask forgiveness for those who believe, saying, Our Lord, thou dost comprehend all things in thy mercy and knowledge. So forgive those who repent and follow his, thy way and protect them from the punishment of hell. And make them, our Lord, into the gardens of eternity which thou hast promised them, as well as such of their fathers and their wives and their children as are virtuous. Surely thou art the mighty, the wise, and protect them from evils, and he whom thou dost protect from evils on that day, him hast thou surely shown mercy, and that indeed is the supreme triumph. Jazakallah. <clears throat> Next is poem by Bilal Raja Sahib. Uh, 
السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ پاکیزہ منظوم کلام سیدنا حضرت اقدس مسیح معود و مہدی معود علیہ صلاۃ وسلام اے عزیزو سنو
क्या क्या निशान बात 
जब उसकी याद आती है बात जब उसकी याद आती है याद से सारी खल जाती है याद से सारी खल जाती है सीने में नक्शे हक जमा जमाती है दिल से गैर खुदा उठाती है दिल से गैर खुदा दर्द मंदों की है दवा वही एक दर्द मंदों की है दवा वही एक है खुदा से खुदा नुमा वही एक है खुदा से खुदा नुमा वही एक हम पाया खुरे खुदा वही एक हमने पाया खुरे खुदा वही एक हमने देखा है दिल हमने देखा है दिल खबर ही नहीं उन पे उस यार की नजर ही नहीं उस यार की नजर ट्रांसलेशन बाय उमर शहीद साहेब
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The following is the English translation of the just recited couplets from a poem written by our beloved Hazrat Masih Maud alayhi salam, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, India. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, India wrote, Hark, O friends, without the Holy Quran, man can never reach the truth. Those who don't even know of this spiritual light, that dear friend does not even watch over them. There is this unique trait in the Holy Quran that it makes one fond of the beloved, the one who is named the Great Almighty. The Holy Quran gives good tidings of his existence. The Holy Quran compels one to the beloved's lane. And then what a host of signs the Holy Quran shows. All the time, the Holy Quran fills the heart with spiritual light and cleanses the breast so thoroughly. How can I recount all of its traits? The Holy Quran gives the soul a new life altogether. The Holy Quran shines like a resplendent star. How can one ever deny it? The Holy Quran brought us unto our beloved. Finding it, we found that friend. That entire writing is an ocean of wisdom. The Holy Quran offers a cup of God's love to drink. Whenever we recollect God's speech, all creatures are driven away from the mind. The Holy Quran imprints an image of God in the heart. All else from the heart, the Holy Quran removes. For the kind-hearted, the Holy Quran is the only cure except for God and is the only guide unto him. We find the Holy Quran to be the only guiding light, and it is the only thing we've seen that charms the heart. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم On behalf of Jamaat USA, we requested Khalifatul Masih to send us a message at the occasion of this Jalsa Salana. Hazur Anwar Ayyadah Ta'ala bin Nasir Aziz graciously sent the message. It is in English. I will read it first in original message in English and then translation in Urdu. Hazur said, Dear members of Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat USA, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah Almighty has granted you the opportunity to convene your Jalsa Salana, as you are aware, and I have mentioned this many times during your functions, that the Prophet Messiah salam, came with two purposes. Firstly, to exhort mankind to fulfill the rights of Allah, and secondly, to fulfill 
the rights of his creation. Therefore, you should direct your full attention towards the worship of Allah, be of those who fulfill the obligation of his worship, and also fulfill the rights of others. It is vital that you emphasize these fundamental aspects of teachings of the Prama Messiah salam, during the Tarbiyat programs which you routinely organize. It is necessary for you to cultivate an atmosphere of love and affection among yourselves and within the Jamaat, and for you to respect and take care of each other in the in best manner. In this regard, Prime Messiah salam, has stated, you who are the community of the Prime Messiah, you who yearn to join the community of the companion of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, must develop within yourself the hue of the companions. Show obedience like them, show mutual love and brotherhood like them. In every aspect, in every quality, adopt a nature that is similar to the companion. USA is a long-established Jamaat and comprises some Ahmadis who are well off and prosperous. They should consider it their obligation to render assistance to their less fortunate brothers. In this regard, the Prime Messiah salam, has stated, Allah Almighty has raised a new community of which the rich, poor, young and old are all a part of. Thus, it is the duty of the poor to respect and value their honorable brothers, and it is the duty of the rich to help the poor and not consider them lowly and of little worth. That is because they are brothers with one another, even though their fathers are not the same, but ultimately the spiritual father is the same for all and they are the branches of the same tree. Further, according to the command of Allah Almighty, Financial sacrifices in the cause of Allah are always to be very much encouraged because they are crucial for the success of our programs and for the achievements of the objectives of the Jamaat. <clears throat> Indeed, the Prime Messiah salam, has reminded us that even the Holy Prophet wasallam, encountered the need for financial contributions to attend to religious needs. So these noble virtues should be inculcated among you and the USA Jamaat to strive to advance and progress greatly in acquiring these pious qualities. May Allah enable you to do so. I also wish to draw your attention to the importance of the belief. The Prime Messiah alayhi salam, has stated that we should devise programs and schemes for the propagation of Islam. This is a fundamental task and it is imperative that you attend to fulfilling your duty in this regard. The pioneer missionaries who arrived in, US, in the USA focused greatly on tabligh and many people entered the fold of the Jamaat through their efforts, but afterward Unfortunately, their descendants were not able to follow them into becoming members of the Jamaat. You should now consider it your responsibility to search for those descendants of the early Ahmadis and try to guide them back into the blessed fold of the Jamaat. It is essential for every member of the Jamaat to offer some time for the purpose of the belief and strive for the preaching of Islam in the USA. Nothing can be achieved by mere lip service. When you organize these programs, each one of you will have to give your time until and unless all the men, young and old, and women are all with, are, and women are willing to sacrifice their time. This mission 
cannot be accomplished. Therefore, it is imperative that you seriously focus on trying to fulfill your preaching responsibilities. The Pramasaya alayhi salam has stated the duty of preaching is a position of lofty stature and as it were possesses within it the nature and grandeur of prophethood provided that and one does not neglect the fear of God. A person who exhorts others receives an opportunity to particularly reform their own selves as well because in the least it is necessary for a person to show others that they practice what they preach. May Allah enable you to follow this guidance. May Allah make your jalsa successful in all respects and may all the participants benefit from the proceeding and thereby gain the immense blessing of Allah, the Almighty. May Allah bless you all. Wassalam, your sincerely. Mirza Masroor Ahmad Khalifatul Masih the fifth. The Urdu translation. Pyare Abawe Jamaat America. Pyare Abawe Jamaat Ahmadiyya America. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah Taala ne aap ko jalsa salana munakid karne ki taufiq ata farmai hai. Jaisa ke aap jaante hain aur maine aap ki takribat mein mutadil baar is baat ka zikr kiya hai. کہ حضر مسیح معاود علیہ السلام کی بحثت کی دو اغراض ہیں اول لوگوں کو حقوق اللہ کی ادائیگی کی طرف توجہ دلانا اور دوم اس کی مخلوق کے حقوق ادا کرنا اس لئے آپ کو پورے انہیں ماک کے ساتھ خدا تعالیٰ کی عبادت کی طرف توجہ کرنی چاہیے آپ ایسے بنیں کہ خدا تعالیٰ کی عبادت کے فرائض بھی پورے کرنے والے ہوں اور دوسروں کے حقوق بھی ادا کرنے والے ہوں یہ نہت ضروری ہے کہ آپ روز مرہ کے تربیتی پروگراموں میں حضرت مسیح معاود کی تعلیمات کے ان بنیادی پہلوں پر زور دیں آپ کو چاہیے کہ آپ اپنے باہمی تعلقات اور ہی طرح جماعت کے اندر بھی پیار و محبت کی فضا کو فروغ دیں اور بہترین طریقے پر ایک دوسرے کا خیال رکھیں اور عزت اور احترام کے ساتھ پیش آئیں اس سلسلے میں حضرت مسیح معاود علیہ السلام فرماتے ہیں اس لیے جو تم مسیح معاود کی جماعت کہلاتی ہو جو مسیح معاود کی جماعت کہلا کر صحابہ کی جماعت سے ملنے کی آرزو رکھتے ہو اپنے اندر صحابہ کا رنگ پیدا کرو اطاعت ہو تو ویسی ہو باہمی محبت اور اخوت ہو تو ویسی ہو غرض ہر رنگ میں ہر صورت میں تم وہی شکل اختیار کرو جو صحابہ کی تھی جماعت احمدی امریکہ ایک لمبے عرصے سے قائم ہے اور اس میں کئی ایسے خوشحال اور صاحب حیثیت احمدی موجود ہیں جنہیں اپنے ضرورت مند بھائیوں کی مدد کرنا اپنے اوپر لازم کر لینا چاہیے اس زمن میں حضرت مسیح معاود علیہ السلام فرماتے ہیں خدا تعالیٰ نے یہ نئی قوم بنائی ہے اس میں امیر و غریب بچے جوان بوڑے ہر قسم کے لوگ شامل ہیں پس غریبوں کا فرض ہے کہ وہ اپنے معزز بھائیوں کی قدر کریں اور عزت کریں اور امیروں کا فرض ہے کہ وہ غریبوں کی مدد کریں ان کو فقیر اور ظلیل نہ سمجھیں کیونکہ وہ بھی بھائی ہیں گو باپ جدا جدا ہوں مگر آخر تم سب کا روحانی باپ ایک ہی ہے اور وہ ایک ہی درخت کی شاخیں ہیں مزید برام ہے اللہ تعالیٰ خدا تعالیٰ کے حکم کے مطابق ہمیشہ اس کی راہ میں مالی قربانیوں کی خاص طور پر تحریک اور حوصلہ افضائی کرنی چاہیے کیونکہ یہ ہمارے پروگراموں کی کامیابی اور جماعت کے مقاصد کو پورا کرنے کے لیے بہت اہم ہیں حضرت مسیح معاود علیہ السلام ہمیں اس ضروری عمر کی طرف توجہ دلاتے فرماتے ہیں کہ دینی ضروریات کے انجام دینے کے واسطے چندوں کی ضرورت آہاں حضرت صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کو بھی پیش آئی تھی پس ان پاک خسلتوں کو اپنی زندگیوں کا حصہ بنائیں اور جماعت احمدیہ امریکہ کو ان نیک خوبیوں کو اپنانے اور ان میں ترقی کرنے کی خاص کوشش کرنی چاہیے اللہ تعالیٰ آپ کو اس کی توفیق دے اس طرح میں آپ کی توجہ تبلیغ کے ہم فریدے کی طرف بھی مبدول کرانا چاہتا ہوں حضرت مسیح معاود نے فرمایا ہے کہ ہمیں اسلام کی شاعت و ترویج کے لیے مختلف قسم کے پروگرام اور اسکیمیں بنانی چاہیے یہی آپ کی بنیادی ذمہ داری ہے اور نہت ضروری ہے کہ آپ اس کو سر انجام دینے کے لیے پوری کوشی کریں امریکہ میں آنے والے ابتدائی مبلقین نے تبلیغ پر خصوصی توجہ دی اور ان کی کوششوں کی بدالت بہت سارے لوگ جماعت احمدیہ میں شامل ہوئے لیکن اس کے بعد بدقسمتی سے ان ابتدائی احمدیوں کی اولادیں ان کے نقش قدم پر نہ چل سکیں اور اپنے آپ کو احمدیت کے ساتھ وابستہ نہ رکھ پائیں اب آپ کو چاہیے کہ اپنی ذمہ داریاں سمجھیں 
اور ان اولین احمدیوں کی نسلوں کو تلاش کریں اور ان کی رمائی کرتے ہوئے انہیں دوبارہ جماعت احمدیہ کے برکت نظام میں شامل کرنے کی کوشش کریں آپ میں سے ہر فرد جماعت کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ وہ آپ میں سے ہر فرد جماعت کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ وہ تبلیغ کے لیے کچھ وقت مختص کرے اور امریکہ میں اسلام کے پیغام کو پہنچانے کے لیے خاص کوشش کرے صرف باتوں سے کچھ حاصل نہیں ہوگا جب بھی آپ ایسے پروگراموں کا انعقاد کرنا چاہیں تو چاہیے کہ آپ میں سے ہر ایک ان کے لیے وقت نکالے جب تک ہر مرد چھوٹا اور بڑا اور ہر عورت وقت کی قربانی کے لیے تیار نہیں ہوگی یہ مقصد پورا نہیں ہوگا اس لیے یہ نہایت ضروری ہے کہ آپ سنجیدگی کے ساتھ اپنی تبلیغی ذمہ داریاں پورے کرنے کی طرف بھرپور توجہ کریں حضرت مسیح معاود علیہ السلام فرماتے ہیں واز کا منصب ایک اعلیٰ درجہ کا منصب ہے اور وہ گویا شان نبوت اپنے اندر رکھتا ہے بشرطے کہ خدا ترسی کو کام میں لایا جائے واز کرنے والا اپنے اندر خاص قسم کی اصلاح کا موقع پا لیتا ہے کیونکہ لوگوں کے سامنے یہ ضروری ہوتا ہے کہ کم از کم اپنے عمل سے بھی ان باتوں کو کر کے دکھاوے جو وہ کہتا ہے خدا تعالیٰ آپ کو ان ہدایت پر عمل کرنے کی توفیق عطا فرمائے خدا تعالیٰ آپ کے جلسہ کو ہر لحاظ سے کامیاب کرے اور تمام شاملین جلسہ کی کاروائی سے بھرپور طریقے پہ مستفید ہوں اور خدا تعالیٰ کے فضلوں کے وارث بنے اللہ تعالیٰ آپ سب پر اپنا فضل فرمائے وسلام آپ کا مخلص مرزا مسرور احمد خلیفۃ المسیح خامس May Allah enable us to follow these directions of Khalifatul Masih Ta'ala bin Nasr Aziz. As I said many times before, when we request Sajrat Khalifatul Masih and solicit his message, I think it is morally incumbent upon us that we listen to his advice and directives and try our best to strive and to follow those directions. May Allah also make us worthy of the recipient of his prayers and may Allah bless all the participants of this Jalsa and give us and uh, shower us his, bless, his blessing on us during and after Jalsa. Now we start the rest of the program. Jazakallah. We do dua now before we start the program. Amin. Next speech is Al Ghafoor, Our Forgiving God by Fahim Yunus Qureshi Sahib. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أبو بكر الشبلي 
was an Iraqi governor in the ninth century. He was a strong man from a rich family, but he ruled with an iron man, iron fist. He was cruel. His cruelties were well known. He would flog people publicly. He would dishonor women. He would confiscate people's homes. And everyone was aware of his cruelties, except himself. That's pretty common. Research shows that when asked, are you self-aware of what you're doing? About 85% of us say yes. But in reality, just 10 to 15% of us are actually self-aware. We commit sins intentionally and unintentionally, knowingly and unknowingly, until a life-changing event happens. A, dis a disobedient son, always saying bad words to his mother, finds out that the mother died of a sudden death. A man spends decades of his life making money, only to find out that he has stage four lung cancer. And a youth realizes that a friend has leaked their private video on social media. Shibli had a similar life-changing event. During the ninth century, Iraq, the king in Iraq, was trying to squash a rebellion in Iran, and many generals previously had failed to achieve that goal for the king. And finally, the king selected one of his best generals, and he sent him to Iran. This general fought valiantly for six to 12 months, and then finally was able to regain those territories, and the king was super happy. So now he arranges a ceremony where this general is going to be venerated. Shibli was also invited to the ceremony. As it sometimes happens, after long travel, this general was sick. He had a upper respiratory tract infection. He was coughing and sneezing. In the royal palace, he's bestowed with gifts, including a royal robe. While wearing the robe, the general coughed and sneezed, and not finding a handkerchief, he cleaned his mouth and nose with that robe. The king saw that. He was furious. The king said, you just disrespected this robe that I bestowed on you. I'm going to fire you from your position immediately, and you take off this robe. This was Shibli's life-changing event because he started crying. He started sobbing, and the king says, what happened? I haven't said anything to you. He said, my lord, if I don't cry, who will? Because this man, this general, just gave a year of his life. He put his life at risk, his honor at risk, only to please you, and you couldn't forgive this small little mistake. And you were so angry. And how angry my God will be with me, because I have been disrespecting this physical robe that he bestowed on me, my eyes and my ears and my body, that I have been using to inflict cruelties on my people just so I can please you. The governor, Shibli, resigned from his position and left immediately. Now Shibli needed forgiveness. He had regrets. Many of us do as well. Studies say that if we did a poll in this room right now, 80 to 90% of you, me, we have regrets. We remember our sins. Even some of those who may appear holy, Hazrat Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wa salam says, Bohut se logon ko Allah ki sattari nahi nek bana rakha hai. Many people appear pious only because of the Allah's veil over their sins. So we all need forgiveness. And who is going to forgive us? If not Allah, then who? Allah Ta'ala asks this question. Who can forgive sins except Allah? And there is a no doubt. Let's get this out of the way. I don't want to spend the rest of the time trying to convince you that Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim because 
It is everywhere in Holy Quran, nearly 200 times in one book. Allah Ta'ala mentions that He's the most forgiving, He's the most merciful. Just the term Ghafurur Rahim is mentioned 72 times. Allah is Ghafurun Halim, the most forgiving, most forbearing. He's Ghafurun Shakur, the most forgiving, most appreciating. He's Ghafurul Wadud, the most forgiving, most loving. Not only He forgives, he then forgets, as if we never committed the sin. He extends his love to us. Some would argue, if Allah is for, so forgiving, why does he need my five daily prayers? Many youth, you read this on social media, why does your God care about my relationships or my sexual orientation? And some people have this feeling that God's gonna forgive me because I'm just such a good person doesn't work that way. There is no customized Islam. You can't customize this book. You want to have it your way, go to Burger King. That's their slogan, have it your way. In Islam, we say we hear and we obey. So we can't be secretly having relationships and justify them as Islamic. We cannot associate the word pride with LGBT practices and then also claim to have pride in Holy Quran. We cannot fool ourselves by believing that parda or five daily prayers are not necessary because I'm just such a good person. See, we cannot practice Islam at the lowest level and then expect forgiveness at the highest level. Islam is a balanced religion. Allah Ta'ala says very clearly that the treacherous, the arrogant, those who mock His signs, there are clear commandments that there will be consequences. Allah Ta'ala says those who have rejected the signs of Allah shall certainly receive a severe punishment. However, this is important. In a hadith Qudsi, Allah Ta'ala says, My mercy prevails over. Shibli had a lot of. He would go to people right and left. He would find scholars and saintly people and say, Is there a path for me for forgiveness? Can you please pray for me? Because I've been inflicting pain and torture on my people. And all these so-called scholars would say, because his sins were well known, they said, uh, we can't pray for you. We don't think there is a path for you. That's a dangerous culture. He says, in this vision, I see the day of judgment. And there's a lot of commotion. And this one humble man who's standing there trembling. And next to him is a decorated, supposedly, seemingly pious man. And there are lots of people around. So this supposedly pious man says to this other person, I swear upon God, you're not going to get forgiven. And the people around, they start shaking their head as if, yeah, you know, Allah is not going to forgive him. Upon this, a thundering voice comes and says, Who just said, who are you to say and swear in my name that I cannot forgive? Because I have now forgiven this person. And as for you, I've ruined your deeds. And that poor man happily hops into the paradise. So let's be very careful. We're not here to judge people, but the reality is, Shaitan runs through our veins. Remember self-awareness, unintentional, unknowing sins? It happens. I know of an office holder who was sitting in the masjid. And this is a time when they were in the masjid for a meeting. And then Hazur Anwar, Ayyadallahu Ta'ala bin Nasr al-Aziz's live address started from UK. So they stopped their meeting and everybody is now watching the live address. And this office holder says, there's a young man sitting next to me. The moment this address started, he takes his cell phone out and he starts texting. 
And throughout that text, throughout the address, this young man is on his phone. And this office holder says that I was fuming such disrespect. And he was constantly thinking, when will this speech conclude so I can talk to this young man? And as he was about to talk to this young boy, he saw that this young man was not texting. He was actually taking notes of Hazur Anwar's speech. He was writing down salient points. But see, very easy to look at someone else and assume. Very hard to take notes of what we want and what we should be changing about ourselves. But if we want Allah's forgiveness, that's what we have to do. And yet everyone wrote Shibli off. This poor man, Abu Bakr, a Shibli, who's now not a governor anymore, finally reaches a saintly person, Hazrat Junaid Baghdadi, Rahmullah. When he comes to Junaid and makes the same request, Junaid Baghdadi said, absolutely, Allah forgives all sins. But the reality is, are you also willing to demonstrate your remorse? Are you going to come meet halfway, do something on your end? And Shibli said, absolutely. Because he was thinking about all of these atrocities that he had committed. And then Junaid Baghdadi gave him a path. He said, go back to the city where you served as a governor, knock on every door, and seek forgiveness from every man, every woman, every child. And once you're done with that town, come back to me. That's hard. That's really hard. You think about it yourself. Apology is not a fancy thing in our culture today. They talk of blameless apology in our culture, which, is, which goes like, uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Or I'm sorry, but. That's not an apology. True apology, Hadrat Masih Madhullah Salatu Wasalam says, has five components. It starts with the true remorse. It has to be unconditional. There has to be a commitment to change. There has to be a willingness to compensate for the wrongs. And ultimately, there has to be a promise never to commit that sin again. But who wants to disgrace themselves to that, dis that degree, right? Who wants to fall on their own sword? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no one humbles himself for Allah except that Allah raises his status. This is the teaching that Masim Adalai brought to us. But sometimes it's too late. See, you want to do, you want to go and apologize. I mean, the son who was rude to his parents or the woman who neglected her father-in-law, now wants to repent, but they're gone. What do you do? Right? That creates depression, despair. We're human beings. We have emotions. And Allah Ta'ala answers that. Allah says in Holy Quran, O oh, my servants who have committed excesses against their own souls, despair not of the mercy of Allah. Surely Allah forgives all sins. Despair not. The disobedient child still has a path. Offer your five daily prayers and be mindful, thoughtful, purposeful. When you say, Rabbana li wale wale nearly ten times a day, our Lord, forgive me and my parents. That's a way to atone. And this is an interesting, beautiful hadith. Azza says, Verily, Allah Almighty will raise the status of a righteous servant in paradise, and they will say, O oh Lord, what is this? Essentially saying, We're dead. How can our stature be raised? And Allah Ta'ala will say, This is due to your child seeking forgiveness for you. The man who wasted his life away chasing money should do charity. Rasulullah says, Charity extinguishes sin just like water extinguishes fire and if you're, there is a youth out there who's worried 
about their private life getting leaked on social media and their image getting destroyed, stop worrying about your image in front of your friends. Think of what is your image in front of Allah Ta'ala. That's much more important. Hazrat Masih Madh alayhi salam says, Dunya ki lanaton se mat daro, ke wo dhuayen ki tarah dekhte hi dekhte ghaib ho jati hai. Be not afraid of the curses of the world, for they shall vanish before your eyes like smoke. Balke tum khuda ki lanat se daro, jo asman se nazil hoti hai, aur jis par padti hai, اس کی دونوں جہانوں میں بے کنی کر جاتی ہے حضور سیز that this is what you should be afraid of fear instead the curse of God which descends from heaven and uproots its victim in both worlds and sometimes old age causes depression people think I'm old I have an earth full of sin what do I do now Again, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah ta'ala says in a hadith of Qudusi, O son of Adam, if you come to me with an earth full of sins, I will meet you with an earth full of forgiveness. Allah just doesn't forgive. Allah is ghafoorul wudud. He forgives and then elevates, goes above and beyond. In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah ta'ala says, Illa man taaba wa amana, except those who repent and believe, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَائِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ And do good deeds, Allah will change their evil deeds into good ones. بَقَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمًا Because Allah is most forgiving, merciful. How does Allah do this? Hazrat Muslim Maud رضي الله عنه narrates a story of Hazrat Muawiyah رضي الله who overslept one morning and missed his Fajr prayer. When he woke up, he was so remorseful, so embarrassed. He did so much istighfar and cried hard. He couldn't believe that he missed his fajr. Next morning, he sees a vision and there's someone waking up Muawiyah. And he says, who, who are you? He says, I'm Satan. Wake up, do your fajr prayer. Hazrat Muawiyah says, shouldn't you be urging me to remain asleep? And Satan says, yeah, that's what I did yesterday. But you cried so hard, your istighfar was so pure that God commanded the angels that instead of counting one sin, you should be granted ten blessings. This is our God. The point of the story, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not the quantity of our sins that matter. It's the quality of our repentance. It's not whether Allah will forgive us, it's whether we will truly seek forgiveness. And for that, we need to foster a culture of forgiveness. Rasulullah said, Show mercy and you will be shown mercy. Forgive and Allah will forgive you. But is that what we're doing? In a forgiving culture, people are granted second chances. In a forgiving culture, we think of ourselves and our shortcomings. We don't focus on others. In a forgiving culture, People don't spend time scheming how to destroy someone's reputation. In a forgiving culture, people don't question someone else's intent. People don't get offended because someone showed disagreement with their opinion. In a forgiving culture, people don't hold back salam because they were not invited on the wedding or the party. And in a forgiving culture, Family members don't block the phone numbers of their siblings. This is happening. You know that and I know that. The petty, passive-aggressive stuff is happening because shaitan runs through our veins. But what do we need to do? What is our teaching? Harat Masih Mahd alayhi salatu wa salam says, Tum mein se ziyada bazurg wohi hai jo apne bhai ke gunah bakhshita hai. اور بدبخت ہے جو زد کرتا ہے اور نہیں بخشتا سو اس کا مجھ میں حصہ نہیں حضور says more saintly among you is the one who excels in forgiving his brother's sins and unfortunate are those who insist and don't forgive like many other virtues 
If you want to see this virtue of forgiveness, the best living example today is Hazrat Khalifatul Masih. May Allah grant him a long, healthy life. Hazur knows our weaknesses. Hazur sees our shortcomings. Yet he travels thousands of miles. He crosses oceans and time zones. He fights ill health and stands up. So you could have, I could have a picture of my family with him. Rewind the clock and ask in your own mind, did we deserve that picture? Was it justice? Because many people, when they're being cruel, they're saying, I'm fair. I'm just trying to do justice, really? If Hazrat Sahib starts doing justice with us, do you know how that would look? If God Almighty started doing justice with us, it's Ehsan. The paradigm that Khalifatul Masih operates in is a paradigm of love and Ehsan. Hazur Anwar says that the happiest day of my life is when I get a recommendation to forgive someone. Shibli went door to door. He was told by Junaid Baghdadi the only way to be good again is to seek forgiveness from others. Initially, people would come out and they hesitated. They're like, oh, you are our governor, you're a big shot. How can we even be upset with you? And he gave them that psychological safety and told them, I have resigned from my governorship. I come to you as a vulnerable, common man. He said, punish me with whatever punishment you think is fair, but forgive me in the end. Please forgive me. Of course, there was a culture of forgiveness. People started forgiving him. But he had gone to just five to seven houses in the town that word spread. That you know you want to go see that governor in rags? And he's crying and going around seeking forgiveness. People opened their doors and the streets were outpouring. People came out and they said, you don't need to drop down any further. And they were crying. They were saying, we've forgiven you. That's the power of a real apology. People forgave Shibli, but how do we know if Allah Ta'ala also forgave him? A child asked this question to Hazur Anwar in a mulaqat, that how do I know Allah forgave me? And Hazur Anwar said, if you stop making the same mistake again, that's a sign that Allah has granted you forgiveness. After that public act of mass repentance and mass forgiveness, Shibli stopped his cruelties. He started rebuilding himself. He became a well-known disciple of Hazrat Junaid Baghdadi Rahmullah. And a thousand years later, Hazrat Muslim Aud narrates his story in Sayre Rouhani. Shibli died as Abu Bakr, a Shibli Rahmullah, in the year 941. My brothers and sisters, we are all weak, flawed, sinful people. But we must believe that Allah's mercy, His forgiveness prevails over His wrath. And there's no point in all these speeches if we're not going to change. None of this is worth anything if there's no action. I'd find this deeply inspiring and perhaps a source of forgiveness if one person withdrew their case from Amurayama after hearing this. If one person said, I don't want to go to Kaza. If one family unblocked their brother and sister. That's what we need. That's why we come to Jalsas for personal action. And there are so many ways in which Allah forgives, it's impossible for me to cover them. But let's go over five very specific, easy actions for each and every one of us. First of all, believe that Allah forgives. Seek forgiveness from your friends. Build that culture. As a Khalifatul Masih, we just heard, give the rights of the creator and the rights of the creation. Create that mutual love brotherhood. That's number one. Number two, say salam to each other, particularly to those people who you deliberately avoid. And you know and your heart knows. Why? Rasulullah says, when two Muslims meet and shake hands, their sins are forgiven before they separate. 
such an instant reaction. Now, you have to ask a question, am I avoiding someone with an eye contact? Am I avoiding a salam from someone? If you are, you're at risk. You gotta do that. Number three, offer your five daily prayers. As the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the five daily prayers, Juma prayers and Ramadan, remove bad deeds between one and the next. You have an ongoing forgiveness cycle that way. Number four, do istighfar. Astaghfirullahi rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu alayh. Because the Masih Madalai Salatu wa Salaam says, istighfar protects you from sins that you do unintentionally, unknowingly. Because we all just established 85% of us do not have self-awareness. Walking, driving, standing in a line, all those dead pockets, forget about your cell phone. Don't pull your cell phone out at that time. Those are moments to do istighfar. Hazrat Masimah salatu wa salam says, sin is a germ that's running through a human's blood, but it can be treated best by istighfar. And number five, make an intention and go perform hajj. Rasulullah says, whoever performs pilgrimage to his house will return free of sin, like the day his mother gave birth to him. If Allah has provided you the means, why not? But remember our God is the most forgiving. Let's walk towards Him. So He runs towards us. And I'll close with the blessed words of the Masih Madh alayhi salatu wa salam. Agar tum khuda ke ho jao, to yakinan samjho ke khuda tumhara hi hai. If you become gods, then most certainly believe that God is only yours. Akhiru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil Pages, the Holy Prophet وسلم, kindness to kin by marriage by Mansoor Ahmad Qureshi Sahib. In all the guests of Promised Messiah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا Chapter 4, verse 2. It's been about 35 years, but I still remember that patient as if it was yesterday. I was a medical student in Karachi, Civil Hospital Karachi, Pakistan. And a family brought a young lady who, uh, in the middle of the night, and as you know the custom, there were many family members with her. Her husband and her mother-in-law were there with, with this young lady. She looked pale. In fact, she looked deathly pale. And we knew that she was in labor and she had lost a lot of blood. I wonder where they were bringing her from. We all got up, students and the team, ready to resuscitate her, we knew she needed blood right away. And in that time, the blood bank system was fairly ordinary, and we needed transfusions from the family members. So we saw her husband was next to us, young man, fairly healthy. We approached him that you need to donate blood right away because otherwise she's not gonna make it. As he's thinking about giving blood, the other lady, his mother, the mother-in-law of this young woman, stepped forward and said, He's not going to give blood. 
is not going to donate anything and he held the hand of his son her son that you're not going to go and do it and i thought personally that she doesn't know what is going on so i approached her and said you know she's your daughter-in-law is going to die if the blood is not given but she would not do that the question is why was she acting that way would she have done that if it was her own daughter why was she treating this young girl young lady a different way she was willing to let her die but wouldn't want her son to give blood we belong to the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his hadith says that we are like one body if one part suffers pain the whole body suffers pain why was she not feeling the pain of this young lady what was going on true story we all got together our students we got together we donated blood and we were able to transfuse and save this lady's life but this is an extreme example but do we see some of this in our communities i hate to say it but once in a while we do hear strange comments coming from families we see that we hear that well the gifts that came with you in your marriage or jahez or dowry is not that good not of standard or your parents didn't teach you well because you can't cook properly at homes or you can't go and meet your parents because when you come back you have all kind of new ideas and so on and so forth we hear all kinds of comments even in our community and this is not unique to us by the way can anyone guess how many what is the percent in the world as to how many families have these challenges bbc.com had an article and they did some research and they found that 3 out of 4 families 75% had difficulties with an in-law and the biggest relation the most challenging relationship was that of the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law but 3 out of 4 families and the causes they put together were it's an issue of control it's an issue of ego criticism unrealistic expectations interference in other family matters like their children's families we're so fortunate though that we belong to the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the ultimate guide the ultimate example for us and he guided us in words and also his personal example in weddings we give out gifts so that the other person remembers how would you feel if you got a gift from the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at your wedding and you all know that that as a loving father he he gave a lasting gift to all of us and you know what that is is the sermon of nikah the collection of verses that the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us is a gift to us it's our duty to pay attention to those verses and get those lessons that help throughout our life the verse that i recited chapter 4 verse 2 is included in in those verses of nikah it is included in that gift a message from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for all of us now i'll read the translation and think for a moment he is addressing you directly the verse reads o ye people fear your lord who created you from a single soul and created their form its mate and from then twain spread many men and women and fear allah in whose name you appeal to one another and fear him particularly respecting ties of relationship this is allah taala says fear particularly respecting ties of relationship verily allah watches over you and in urdu ae logo apne rab ka taqwa ikhtiyar karo jisne tumhe ek jaan se paida kiya aur usi se uska joda banaya aur phir in dono mein se mardon aur auraton ko bakasrat phaila diya اور اللہ سے ڈرو جس کے نام کے واسطے دے کر تم ایک دوسرے سے مانگتے ہو اور رحموں کے تقاضوں کا بھی خیال رکھو یقیناً اللہ تم پر نگران ہے واٹ از دا میسج دا میسج آف یونٹی اللہ از ابو آل آف اس بٹ انڈر نیتھ ہم وی آر آل سنگل سول بیکاز وی کم فرام اے سنگل سول ڈزنٹ میٹر واٹ از آر بیک گراؤنڈ ویئر وی لیو واٹ از آر فائنینشیل اسٹیٹس واٹ لینگویج وی اسپیک which college we went to 
how big of a house we have, what type of clothes we wear, it doesn't matter. What type of car we drive, we're all one soul under Allah the Almighty. And then after talking about unity, Allah Ta'ala brings the concept of relationships, Rahmi relationships. Because we are all the same. And then Allah Ta'ala says, fear Allah. Keep Him in mind because He is above all of us. But the point I want to make is that the verse doesn't end there. After talking, fearing Allah two times in the verse, Allah Ta'ala adds, Inna Allaha kana alaykum raqiba. That verily Allah is watching. Allah watches over you. Yaqeenan Allah tum par nigran hai. Jab rishton ki baat hui, Allah Ta'ala ne karne ke baad, apni nigrani ka zikr bhi firma diya. That after mentioning about relationship, Allah has mentioned, I am watching. I am watching what you do behind the closed doors. You may say I'm very gracious and, and, and kind to my family, my in-laws, my daughter-in-law and son-in-law, but he's watching. The Holy Prophet ﷺ did not leave just words for us. It, he left practical examples. His first beloved wife whom he married when he was 25 and at, at, at the age of 40 when he receives the revelation, the message, he's concerned, he goes to his wife and what, is, what does she say? That is recorded in the history. Again, a lesson for us. The response of Hazrat Khadija radiallahu anha, his wife was, by Allah, Khadija said, Allah shall never subject you to any indignity, for you always maintain your ties with those of your kin. It's a longer passage, but aap sila rahmi karte hain, aap rishadaron ka khayal rakhte hain. Coming from a wife means that not only was he kind to his own relatives, but those of hers as well. My dear brothers and sisters, if I use the word paradise or jannat, what comes to mind? Peaceful life after death, comfort, closeness to Allah the Almighty. This paradise descended in the homes of the Holy Prophet And this paradise then spread through the community and his believers around him. Let us take a glimpse of, although there are many aspects of it, but the topic that I'm talking about, relationship with a kin in marriage, or susrali rishidar as we call it in Urdu, let's take a glimpse of how it was. You know, we worry about one set of susral or in-laws. The Prophet ﷺ had nine of them. And he, but never do we hear any problems amongst the relationship. He married young and old, rich and poor, ordinary and noble, his tribes or from other tribes, but never once there was any issue. What was the result of all these marriages? Everybody came together. All these tribes and these difficulties that were having amongst those tribes, they were resolved with Hazrat Ummi Habiba radiallahu anha was the daughter of Abu Sufyan, a staunch enemy of the Holy Prophet Once the marriage took place, his animosity ended and eventually he accepted Islam. Hazrat Javeria radiallahu anha, a wife of the Holy Prophet sallallahu she was daughter of a staunch, bitter enemy of the Holy Prophet sallallahu Haris bin Abi Zarar. He was fighting with the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and when the fighting, when the marriage took place, as the customs at, at that time, many Muslims released all the the prisoners and the families that were in in that war. But Hazrat, here's the story. Hazrat um, Javeria's father found out about the marriage, and he and his son came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with a ransom to have her released. The Prophet could have said, "Get out of here." The war, you know, you were fighting. The Holy Prophet ﷺ responded with kindness. And he asked, asked Hazrat Javeria, what do you want to do? And Hazrat Javeria obviously said, I want to stay with you, Ya Rasulullah. And both her father and brother accepted Islam, seeing the kindness of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Not only coming together, but the respect of the in-laws. We have heard the story, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu, who was father-in-law of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. After the fall of Makkah, he brought his father, elderly father of Hazrat Abu Bakr, to meet the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And what was the response of the Prophet? He could have said, you know, it's about time you come and meet me. But the Prophet ﷺ responded saying, Abu Bakr, why did you bother your father? I would have come to meet him. 
He's the king of Arabia now. And father of the father-in-law, he was showing that respect. One of the companions of uh, Holy Prophet ﷺ, Amr bin al-As, once asked the Holy Prophet ﷺ, Who is your most beloved, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet responded, Aisha. And he said, how about among men? He said, Aisha's father. So again, look at the relationship Hazrat Abu Bakr had and the respect that he had. The Prophet ﷺ did not forget, even after the demise, his in-laws, Hazrat Hala, who is the sister of Hazrat Khadija, she used to come and meet the Prophet ﷺ. She would knock at the door, get permission and enter. And her approach, her ways, her the way she spoke was very similar to Hazrat Khadija. Whenever she would come, the Holy Prophet used to get overcome by the emotions and he would say, Oh Allah, it's Hala. And he would get up in respect of the sister of his wife. Along with respect, the Prophet went out and helped out his in-laws. A story is related of Hazrat, Hazrat Maimuna, his wife, radiallahu anha. She had a, a slave girl and she released her. Prophet sallallahu came and found out about it. He didn't get upset. Said, Why did you do that? He said, what happened? She said, I released the slave girl. Prophet said, if you had given her to your mamu, your uncle who was very deserving in difficulties would have been better for you. Keeping in mind about the relations of his wives. Hazrat Asma, who is the sister-in-law of the Holy Prophet sallallahu daughter of Hazrat Abu Bakr, in fact, stepsister, she and her husband were in extreme difficulty. They, um, they didn't have any resources. The Prophet ﷺ arranged pieces of land for them so that he can cultivate and make their own earnings. Now, you know, they, it should go both ways. If the elders are showing respect, the younger ones also have to show respect and obedience. The Holy Prophet ﷺ used to go and knock at the door of her, his daughter and son-in-law, Hazrat Ali, for months and waking up for Fajr prayer. Now sometimes we say, well, the parents shouldn't interfere. Yes, but what was the interference of Hazrat Pro Holy Prophet ﷺ was waking up for Fajr prayer. And Hazrat Ali or Hazrat Fatma never became upset at that. The Prophet ﷺ, we know that he used to help help out at home. Someone asked Hazrat Aisha, عنها, how was he at home? He said, She said he was just like any ordinary man. He would come, he would help out, mend his clothing, repair his shoes, milk the goats, clean the floor. So if the Prophet ﷺ can do all of that, why can't we let our sons-in-law do that? Or our sons do that? And get upset when our daughter-in-law say, well, you know, about this. So we should treat the same way as the Prophet of Islam ﷺ used to do that. One other aspect I want to relate is that in the life of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, it's amazing, sometimes it seems strange, but he and, you know, mostly his wife, Hazrat Aisha, sometimes had a little discord with the Holy Prophet And she would get upset. And on one occasion, there was something like that. And the Prophet suggested, okay, let's have an arbiter. And he said, let's make Hazrat Umar. And she said, no, he's very harsh. So he said, okay, fine, Abu Bakr. Her, her father, the Prophet is saying, okay, fine, let's have Hazrat Abu Bakr as the arbiter, as the salis. So Hazrat Abu Bakr comes in and the Prophet starts explaining what happened and Aisha says, nee, nee, speak the truth. And on that, Hazrat Abu Bakr obviously got mad and about to hit Hazrat Aisha. What are you saying? Means the Prophet wasn't saying the, tr the truth. The Prophet comes in and helps out Hazrat Aisha and saves her from her father, let alone we see sometimes, some of us men see our wives suffer from in-laws relationships. Here, the Holy Prophet ﷺ was saving her from her own father. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ fulfilled the testimony of Hazrat Khadija that she had given. All his actions are worth noting, but once Hazrat Ibn Umar asked Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, could you quote one quality of the Prophet ﷺ that you like the most? You know what Hazrat Aisha said? Nothing. She started crying. She couldn't console herself. It took a while for her to control her tears. And finally she composed herself and said, everything about him was unique and unusual. How could 
I name one quality. So this is the paradise that descended in the homes of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He loved his family and the family loved him. My dear brothers and sisters, we invite people to Islam Ahmadiyyat. We go out and do tabligh, a noble task. Hazur just talked about that. We invite, say, Islam Ahmadiyyat is the best religion. It's the best code of life. It's a heavenly atmosphere that Islam can create. Do we have that in our homes? When we do the tabligh and invite people to our homes, to our community, do we have that heavenly atmospheres in relationship, in our relationships, in laws, Mecca, Susral, you know, all these fights and tussles. Is that the heavenly atmosphere that Allah Ta'ala or the Holy Prophet expected of us? We hear about brotherhood, muakhat, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is amazing that there is a brotherhood that Allah wants to create through marriage and that is the relationship of in-laws. Marriage is a commandment of Allah Ta'ala and His expectation is that we will create the muahat in marriage or relationship with in-laws. When we meet, even in Jalsa I met so many people, we all try to find a relationship and somehow, yes, we find some common person there. Okay, fine, you know, my khalu, my uncle, my chacha, whoever. So, if we are one big family, which we are, can't we live like one family? The way the Prophet ﷺ lived? We belong to the promised Messiah ﷺ. And Hazur just mentioned his teaching in his, uh, in his letter. Hazur Masih says, Treat all the creation with such deep love as though they are your close family members. And then he said, Treat mankind in the same way that a mother treats her child. Hazrat Muslim Islam is talking about the entire humanity, not our close relatives. So how much he expects us to treat our, our close relatives, our Rishadar, our Susraeli Rishadars, in-laws, if he expects us to treat the entire humanity like a mother treats her child. Now on that note, let me go back to the story I told you earlier. When we were talking to that mother-in-law, and she was refusing, someone came to me from behind and said, Ham denge khun. I will give blood. And I was surprised, I looked back and I here is an old lady, frail, who's standing there. And I said, who are you? She said, I am her mother. She was the mother of that young girl who was on deathbed. And this lady was frail. She was on her deathbed also, but she was willing to give blood to save her daughter. That is what Hazrat Masih Islam, that is the degree of relationship he wants us to have with the humanity. What about our relations, our daughter-in-law? You know, that is the atmosphere. Allah Ta'ala, you know, in the verse Allah Ta'ala talked about Arham. That comes from Allah Ta'ala's attribute, Rahmaniyat. If we cut away the relationships with Rahm, the Rahman Khuda will cut relationships with us. So we have to be very careful. What sort of ego is satisfied when a 50 to 60 year old lady ridicules a 25 year old girl? Or disgraces a 25 year old girl? All I would say is, Inna Allah kana alaykum rakiba. Or what is it? when we taunt a young man or a young girl because of her physical appearance. Inna Allah kana alaykum rakiba. That is the only answer. It's not my answer. It's the answer that the Holy Prophet ﷺ gave when he gave us the gift, the message for our nikahs and wedding. My dear brothers, I didn't say sisters first. My dear brothers, we call ourselves qawam. And we are very proud of that that we are the guardians. Now here is our assignment. If we are the guardian, we have to make sure that we create that atmosphere in our homes, that heavenly at atmosphere in our homes, where there is love in all relationships. Hazrat Masih Islam, you have heard 
once in his standard he's raised his voice on his wife and he for days he repented he offered sadaqat he offered nawafil that was his respect of his wife and sometimes we let our family members ridicule our wives or raise voice against them who do we belong to or do we who do we claim that we belong to in the end let's see the action items for all of us first off let's analyze how are we in relationships with our in-laws let's ask our khadijas let's ask our wives and we should have the the himmat and courage to listen to what they are going to say and i request our sisters to tell us the truth how have we been in relationship with our in-laws and we can give them honest opinion also and then it is time to change hazur said in his letter mere lip service is not going to do anything if you're going to listen to this speech let's go back and make a change we have to change we have to bring that kindness the compassion the respect how about going and saying thanks to our daughter in laws that you lived with my son you have had this home that you have prepared you're raising the children shukriya ada karne mein kya hamara jhad jayega so let's be kind to to our in laws and develop a relationship with them those who are not married where do you want to be in that 75% in the world or you want it in the camp muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam where there is love and affection at home i'm sure the answer is clear i know it is difficult sometimes it's difficult to salvage our pride and ego but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam demands let me read to you a hadith what he demands holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says the person who perfectly maintains ties of kinship is not one who does so because he gets compensated by his relatives but the one who maintains the bond is the one who persists in doing so even though the latter has severed ties of kinship ye nahi hai ke koi rishtedar humse achhai karta hai to hum bhi achhai kar le what the prophet expects is ki agar wo taluqat tod bhi le hum phir bhi usse achhai kare that is the camp muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is the exact expectation that we have so my dear brothers and sisters let us become the nafs wahida that is in the message that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let's create that muwaffaq in marriage that allah taala expects from us let us make our homes paradise where the streams of love flow and where there are gardens of happy families us jannat the, the jannat that it descended in the homes of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let's create the same jannat hamare ghar rasool e khuda ke ghar ki tarah kyun nahi ho sakte we have to at least try and make our homes like that not only jannat for us or paradise for us but paradise for our families they should be able to see ke dekho ye ghar hai meri beti ka jahan pe khushiyan hain if we follow the 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 conduct of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will be able to do that couple of sentences in urdu i must say ke hum apne gharon ko hazrat sallallahu alaihi wasallam ke gharon ki tarah bana ke isme wo jannat lekar aaye jo unke ghar mein basti thi ye wo jannat hai ek to wo jannat thi jahan se hazrat adam ko nikala gaya but ye wo jannat hogi jahan se shaitan ko hamesha ke liye nikal ke phenge ek bhi bachchi aisi na ho jiski aankhon mein aansu ho aur chup chup ke roti ho apne sasural ki zyadati se या एक भी माँ बाप माँ बाप ऐसे ना हो जो रातों की नींद सो ना सकते हो कि कल हमारी लखते की जगह का क्या हाल होगा और एक भी बूढ़ी माँ बेवा ऐसी ना हो जिसको ये सुनना पड़े कि इस घर में या ये रहेगी या मैं रहूंगा दैर इज नॉट वर्ट द प्रॉफिट टोल्ड सो माई डियर ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स इफ वी वॉन्ट टू मेक अ चेंज इट इज टाइम टू टू शो द वर्ल्ड इन दब्लिक दीज आर आर होम्स which are the homes of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will be proud of us in the end i'll read <coughs> a quote from hazrat khalifatul masih al khamis ayyadullah taala anhu uh, uh, who which is heavier and deeper than anything i have said hazur says every ahmadi who is a real muslim should always keep in view that marriage is a bond and is something that becomes a religious obligation in a way marriage is a bond 
that becomes a religious obligation in a way and it is very important to pay the dues of wives and close family ties by both the man and his family and the woman and her family. If the newly wedded couples and both sets of in-laws realize all these matters, family life can be a cradle of love, affection and peace. Hazur farmate hain, Har ahmadi ko, jo haqiqi musalman hai, hamesha saamne rakhna chahiye, ki shadi biya ek aisa muahida hai, ek aisa kaam hai, jo ek lihaz se dini fariza ban jata hai, اور بیویوں اور اس کے رحمی رشتوں کے حقوق ادا کرنے بہت ضروری ہیں مردوں کی طرف سے بھی اور لڑکی والوں اور لڑکی کی طرف سے بھی پس اگر یہ احساس شادی کرنے والے جوڑوں میں پیدا ہو جائے اور دونوں طرف کی سسرالیوں میں بھی تو گھریلو زندگیاں محبت اور پیار اور امن کے گہوارے بن جاتے ہیں انشاءاللہ میں اللہ help us do that اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وبارك وسلم انك حميد مجيد جزاك الله by Asan Mahmood Khan Sahib. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as-salam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa wahtahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh اما بادو فعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن آیاته ان خلق لکم من انفسکم ازواجا لتسکنو علیہ وجال بینکم مودتا ورحمہ اِنَّا فِي ذَلِكَ لَآیَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ The concept of love has captured human imagination, contemplation, and wonder since time immemorial. Love has been the subject of poetry and prose, of psychology and science, of philosophy and film, and love is mentioned in faith and in scripture. There are many forms of love mentioned in religious scripture, like the love God has for his creation, or the love of a mother for a child, or the love between man and woman. But it is only in one scripture, in the Holy Quran, where the love between husband and wife is specifically mentioned as a sign from God himself. In chapter 30, verse 22, the verse that I just recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from among yourselves, that you may dwell in peace and tranquility with them. And he has put love and tenderness between your hearts. Verily in that are signs for those who reflect. The love which develops between husband and wife in matrimony is indeed a miracle of God. Respected Mukarram Amir Sahib and my dear and distinguished guest of the Promise of Sahih al-Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, the topic I have been asked to speak on this evening is 10 years after marriage, staying best friends. And I will present this topic in light of three core aspects of a harmonious marriage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in this verse. Sukoon, Muwadda and Rahma, peace, love, and tenderness. This is the miracle of Allah and the template for us to adopt if we want our marriages to be paradise on earth. Now before beginning, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I myself have been married for 22 years, alhamdulillah. 
but I am standing before you here today discussing this topic of marital harmony with the utmost awareness of my own shortcomings and weaknesses. I don't intend to share anything with you today which is of my own wisdom, but rather it is from the teachings of our faith and the guidance of our Khalifa. This subject has been a learning opportunity for me as much as I hope it will be for this esteemed audience, and I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. So let us analyze these words in Surah Rum one by one that describe the true relationship between husband and wife as Allah manifested himself. The first is sukun, litaskunu alayha, that you dwell in peace and tranquility with one another. Sukun translates into a peaceful happiness. A peaceful home is a paradise on earth, but one that is devoid of peace is a hell in this world. And my dear brothers and sisters, the sad reality is that some of our Ahmadi homes have lost the sukun or happiness. And how big of an issue is this in our households? Well, I would humbly submit that a surrogate marker for unhappiness in marriage is divorce. Now in the United States as a country, and I'm not talking Jamaat here, the divorce rate is 50% according to the latest census data. So half of all marriages in America fail. And on average, it happens at the eight-year mark. But that shouldn't be surprising to us. In fact, most researchers have concluded that societies in which dating and cohabitation prior to marriage are the norm have much higher divorce rates throughout the world. Dating trains you for divorce. It doesn't train you for marriage. But what about within our own Jamaat? Well, we looked at our own data, and it reveals a divorce rate of about 20 to 22%. So one in five marriages ends in divorce, sadly. Now this is far less than that of the society around us, but it is not an insignificant number. And then there are many additional marriages that aren't captured in this data. They don't end in divorce, but they are, they are mired in disharmony and abuse. So there is a lack of sukoon within our households. And it doesn't happen right away. After the so-called honeymoon phase is over and the newness and shine and luster of marriage starts to fade, a transition takes place. Couples must negotiate chores and responsibilities, balance work with life and children, and face bumps on the road. So what are the main reasons for this? I would submit that the overarching cause of lack of peace in marriages is selfishness, focusing too much inwardly than outwardly. Are my rights being honored? Did my spouse do this for me, or did they do that for me? Yes, the Holy Quran grants husbands and wives a set of rights, but also a set of responsibilities. So we must focus on our responsibilities, not whether or not our rights are being granted, because it is our responsibilities to our spouse that we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. Marriage is not a noun, it is a verb. It is not something you get, it is something that you do, it requires work. And if both sides focus on what they are responsible for in a marriage, then both sides will get their rights honored automatically. And we should always remember that the center of marriage, the focal point, should not be ourselves, it should not be our spouses, but it should be Allah. So much so that on the very first day of our marriage, in the nikah prayer that we listen to in our first day, both husband and wife are reminded five times to adopt taqwa, or fear of God. So marriage is rooted in God consciousness. And Hazrat Muslim said, marriage is a, quote, school where we learn the love for God, unquote. Now another frequent cause of lack of sukoon or peace in marriages is disputes over financial matters. And this, point, this too points to a larger problem of a misunderstanding of our roles and our responsibilities in marriage, as outlined in the Quran. In chapter 4, verse 35, Allah Ta'ala says, Ar-rijalo qawamuna ala nisa Men are guardians over women, as we just heard in the previous speech. But qawam does not mean that men are rulers. We are not kings of our own homes. We are guardians. It is a responsibility that we have as husbands and fathers to provide for our families. And then in that same verse, Allah Ta'ala says, Anfiku min anwalehim that not only do we provide for our families, but we must spend of our wealth on them. This is our obligation as husbands. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said that of the dinar, the currency, of the dinar you spend in the cause of Allah, what you spend in procuring the freedom of a slave, or what you give away in charity to the poor, 
or what you spend on your wife and children, the highest in respect of reward is the dinar you spend on your wife and on your children. And when households are confronted with financial hardship, mutual consultation is necessary during stressful times. There is nothing wrong with getting advice from our spouses. During the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, Arabs could not tolerate a woman advising them. Once, the Holy Prophet وسلم's companion, Hazrat Umar's wife, advised him on something, and he replied, who are you to interfere in these matters? And she replied that if the wives of the Holy Prophet وسلم, could give him their advice, and the Prophet allowed this, then how could Umar put a stop to her counsel? Now, if the husband is qawam or guardian, the wife or saleha, the virtuous one, is the caretaker of the home. She is the glue that keeps the family together. And in this role, prudence in household spending is a responsibility that the wives are expected to be mindful of. In his address to Lejna in Germany in 2013, Hazur said, quote, some women possess a habit of creating mayhem, fighting with husbands, uttering bad things, and making demands when financial conditions become tight due to their husband's job loss or business loss, or where there's a lack of affluence. Hazur said, such actions do not yield good results. When such difficult situations arise, it is the duty of the wife to fully support her husband and be content with less. And this verse also instructs women to guard the secrets of their husband, hafizat al guard the secrets of your husbands. Wives here are specifically admonished not to speak ill of husbands in gatherings with friends and respect the privacy and sanctity that is important in any relationship. This will help build trust and help solidify the marital relationship. And in this context, I would add that keeping secrets from your spouse is just as toxic as revealing secrets about them because such behavior destroys the very foundation of marriage which is trust. The blessed wife of the Promised Messiah al-Islam, Hazrat Amma Jan anha, advised her daughter before her marriage, a wife should not hide things from her husband nor do anything that she felt may have to cover up for him, from him. The husband may not see what goes on, but Allah Almighty does. Ultimately, when the matter is exposed, it diminishes the dignity of a woman." Unquote. Another reason for lack of sukoon or peace in homes is using harsh words in an argument. Arguments are going to happen, but words matter in a relationship. According to neuroscientists, the brain handles positive and negative information in different hemispheres. Negative emotions generally involve more thinking, and the information is processed more thoroughly than positive ones. In other words, when you say something nice to your spouse, it registers as a positive experience. But if you say something negative, it cuts deep. It resides in the memory banks a lot longer. So we should choose our words carefully. And if you are on the other end, if you are the recipient of harsh words from your spouse, exhibit forgiveness. We just heard a beautiful speech on al-ghafur, forgiveness. Have selective memory for the good, selective amnesia for the bad. We see that sometimes when the kids are all grown and they've moved on to their own homes, couples later in their marriage are just back to being with one another. But these golden years are sometimes not so golden. They are spent in petty bickering and back and forth arguing and sukoon vanishes. We should remember the Holy Prophet ﷺ said, I guarantee a house in Jannah for one who gives up arguing, even if he is in the right. And it is for this reason that our beloved Hazur Talib Nasr al-Aziz has advised us time and again on multiple occasions, no one is perfect, not us, not our spouses. So when your spouse says something or does something that displeases you, close your eyes, close your ears, and close your mouth. But when your spouse does something that pleases you, you open all three. So to summarize, we should take the good with the not so good. When we appreciate the fragrance of a rose, we also accept the thorns which it bears. There is also a need for husband and wife to adopt husnis saluk or politeness and courtesy with the relatives of each other, as we just heard. Many times the major disputes stem from the fact that husbands and wives are rude or say bad things about one's relatives. And then there's our children. Our children are the first row audience in our marriages. When husband and wife are not on the same page with parenting a child, rifts are created and wedges are formed and alliances are broken. This is when compromise is not only critical, but best done behind the scenes. 
If we are constantly fighting with our spouses in front of our children, they will do the same in their marriages one day. Children may or may not be good at listening, but they never fail to imitate. The Promise of Sayyid al-Islam said that anyone who mistreats his wife is not from my community, and it is the Promise of Sayyid al-Islam's own example, which is there for us as men to follow. On one occasion, some companions were with the Promise of Sayyid al-Islam at a gathering, and they observed that he had a headache, and they advised them that perhaps it was because he was not getting a nutritious meal at home. And the Promise of Sayyid al-Islam said, yes, I think that's what the reason is, but everything has been very busy at home, so perhaps it was overlooked. And the companion said, well, that would never happen in my home, because if that happened, I would be very strict with my wife, and I would never get a meal unless it was a healthy, nutritious meal. To which the Promise of Sayyid al-Islam replied, our friends should refrain from such behavior. And then he went on to describe how on one occasion it so happened that he raised his voice to his wife. He said, I felt that maybe my voice caused some pain even though I had not used any strong language. And after this happened, I continued to do istighfar and very humbly offered nawafo and also gave some sadqa, fearing that this harshness was due to some unknown offense. لِتَسْكُنُوا alayha. This, my dear brothers, is how we achieve the sukoon or peaceful happiness mentioned in the Holy Quran. But we can't discuss sukoon or peace without talking about sukoon's ultimate disruptor, and that is anger. Small disagreements turn into arguments which fester and become fights, and now before you know it, untamed anger has replaced all wisdom and rational thought. And these are the distress calls that come to the Jamaat in the middle of the night when rage turns into violence. Anger is not a sign of strength over your spouse, but rather a sign of weakness and insecurity. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said, the strong man is not the one who defeats another in wrestling. The strong man is the one who has full control over himself in a moment of anger. And the Promise of Sayyid al-Islam described those who go so far as to physically abuse their wives as cowards. And to my dear brothers, please know this. Your level of devo devotion to Jamaat does not give free license to speak harshly to your wife inside your homes when no one is watching. Your regularity in visiting the mosque or what office you hold in Jamaat or whether it's local or national, it doesn't matter. Conduct with our spouses must be of the highest standard. Mulvi Abdul Karim of Sialko Raziyatala Anho was one of the most devoted companions of the Promised Messiah alayhi salam. But he was known on occasion to speak harshly to his wife. And then the Promised Messiah alayhi salam received a divine revelation in Urdu and Arabic. Ye tariq achha nehi. Isse rok diya jaye musulmano ke leader Abdul Karim ko. Khuzo rifka, a rifka, fa inna rifka, rasul khair. Narmi karo, narmi karo, tamam nekiyo ka sadar narmi hai. This is a revelation of God. This is God speaking. This is not a good way. Abdul Karim, the leader of the Muslims, should be told not to pursue it. Be compassionate. Be compassionate. For compassion is the principal virtue. Regarding this divine revelation, the Promised Messiah said, Mulvi Abdul Karim had spoken somewhat harshly to his wife, and this caused the commandment that such harsh language should not be used. This revelation contains guidance for the whole Jamaat that they should treat their wives with kindness and courtesy. Your wives are not your slaves. In point of fact, marriage is a covenant between man and God. Therefore, strive not to be false to your covenant. And what should our wives do when husbands lapse into anger? Follow the advice of Hazrat Ahmadjan, which she shared with her own daughter at the time of marriage. She said, never argue with your husband while he is angry. If your opinions or actions are justified, a dignified wife will express this after her husband's anger has subsided. This leads to a more harmonious household and wins the pleasure of Almighty Allah. And another reason for lack of sukoon in our homes is the ever lurking presence of shaitan, of Satan. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Satan places his throne over the water and sends out his troops. The closest to him in rank are the greatest at causing tribulation. One of them will say, I have done this. And Satan will say, you have done nothing. But another one will say, I did not leave this man alone until I separated him from his wife. And Satan will embrace him and say, you have done well. My dear brothers and sisters, think about it. Satan's most proudest act of mischief is destroying marriages. 
And Satan comes in all forms, hidden and apparent. And while infidelity is a leading cause of divorce in our society, don't think that it's not happening in our own marriages. It is. And adultery can also be virtual. Looking at inappropriate material online is just as damaging. We are reminded in the Quran of fasha or indecent behavior unknown to others, which can manifest into munkar, evil deeds, which become apparent. And the Promised Messiah has talked about the adultery of the mind. It is another technique of Satan to destroy marriages. So spouses should protect not only themselves, but one another against this shaitan. Remember, Allah describes husband and wife as libas, garments for one another. A garment adorns, it covers, it protects. So we should protect our spouses. And Satan can also just be someone with bad intentions, trying to get between a couple when it is least suspected. In an address to Lejda in 2011, Hazur said, and I quote, Satan does not only signify a person whose way of entry may be detected. Each bad company, each bad friend who will destroy your home, who will try and incite you against your husband, against mother-in-law, against sister-in-law, or will try to incite a husband against his wife, or one who will say something trivial that will create anxiety in one's heart, is a Satan. Thus, it is the obligation of every male believer and every female believer to be heedful of such Satans. The foundation of the union of marriage is strengthened once mutual trust is established. If trust is lost, then the very same palace that was erected with the promise of love and affection is brought to the ground and turned into ruin." Unquote. Hazrat Ammajan anha, once advised women to not turn immediately to family or relatives to solve minor problems within the marriage, but instead turn to your own husbands. This helps ensure that the dignity and honor of their husbands is protected, and it guards the privacy of the relationship on matters that can be easily resolved within a marriage. But this is not to say that wives should not seek help if they are in an abusive relationship. In fact, Islam protects the rights of the wife, and the Jamaat allows a channel for help to be provided. And abuse can happen in the other direction as well. Husbands can be victims to emotional blackmail or verbal abuse, sometimes even physical abuse. So yes, divorce is permitted for both husband and wife. It is an unpleasant act in the sight of God, but if a relationship is based on taqwa and all the efforts to salvage the relationship fail, then Allah knows what is in the heart and Allah is merciful and allows for this separation. But decisions about divorce should never be based on fleeting emotions. The Promised Messiah said, a person who is hasty in divorce is sinful in the eyes of God. Do not hasten to break like a dirty vessel, that which God has brought together. So after sukun, Allah reminds us that the next characteristic of a peaceful marriage is muwadda, love. Islamic marriage is often viewed as sterile, like devoid of love, but it should not be. Remember, Allah has forged this love between husband and wife, but it is us who relinquish it. Social scientists often talk about love languages and have identified gestures which are acts to strengthen a marriage. Things like using words of affirmation with one another, or doing acts of service, devoting time, giving gifts. When we analyze these, it should come as no surprise that the love languages talked about today were first exemplified 1400 years ago in the life of Rasulullah and then again in the life of the Promised Messiah and his Khulafa. The Holy Prophet وسلم, would always compliment Hazrat Khadija radiallahu anha and would convey words of appreciation even after her demise. And he would express appreciation to his wives for the very simplest of acts. In the same way, the Promised Messiah and Hazrat Amma Jan embodied the act of exchanging words of affirmation. On one occasion, Hazrat Amma Jan radiallahu anha said to the Promised Messiah I pray that I never see the grief of your death and that Allah Almighty takes me first. To which the Promised Messiah replied, I always pray that you remain alive after me, and I leave you in a peaceful state. Our beloved Hazur, Ayyad al-Tala bin Asul Aziz, is a living example for us as an exemplary husband. Hazur's wife has shared personal reflections of Hazur, how he would help her with household chores and cooking whenever she fell ill. And this while living in very difficult conditions in Africa before Khilafat. And we are all witness to this when Hazur visits us in America. He is always very particular in making sure his wife's welfare 
and comfort is first and foremost. Hazur will not even sit in the car without first waiting for his wife to arrive. And often Hazur gives guidance in personal mulaqat to us about good conduct with our wives. And another love language is receiving and giving of gifts. Behavioral scientists say this enhances a relationship, but it was the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago who said, give gifts and you will love one another. And it's not that you just give a gift on a specific occasion or in exchange for a favor. Saying a good word is a gift. Expression of gratitude as an appreciation for daily gestures like the cooking of a meal or getting groceries or dropping off children, things we take for granted. It takes little effort, but it goes a long way. Remember, it is not joy which brings one gratitude. It is gratitude which brings one joy. We should think of our relationship with our spouse as an emotional bank account where you make deposits and withdrawals to maintain a balance. We should make more deposits and less withdrawals. Give your spouse a gift. Give your spouse a thank you. Compliment your spouse. Compliment your spouse in front of your children. Dress nicely for your spouses and look presentable as much at home as you do outside. And for those in the audience who are newly married or about to get married, the best way to start off your marriage is by waking one another up in the solitude and darkness of the early morning for prayer. Nothing strengthens the bond of marriage in Islam like praying together. And this brings us to the last trait of marriage mentioned in the opening verse, and that is rahma. Now, rahim or rahim is commonly understood to mean mercy. But Allah in his infinite wisdom chooses the word rahma because rahma has a much deeper meaning in Arabic lexicon. It means tenderness, to favor one another, to benefit someone, to pardon, to forgive. In other words, the pinnacle of marital harmony is rahma. And when rahma is practiced in its purest form, muwadda or love comes naturally. And for this too, we look at the example of the Promised Messiah When the Promised Messiah got married to Hazrat Amma Jan radiallahu anha, she had the habit of sleeping with the lights on. But he had the habit of sleeping in the dark. So every night he would keep the lights on for his wife until she fell asleep, and then he would turn out the lamp. If she awoke in the middle of the night, he would relight the lamp. Eventually, the Promised Messiah Islam, became accustomed to sleeping in the light, and lights were installed in all the rooms and above the stairs, and he even employed someone to be responsible for keeping the lights on. Decades later, after a beautiful and successful and long-lasting marriage, Hazrat Amma Jan said, do you remember that time when you could not sleep in the light? And now, unless every corner of the house is filled with the light, you cannot sleep. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the template for affection, for adaptation, for compromise, and for love that we should all follow. Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmad radiallahu anhu described the love his parents had for one another as, quote, one heart beating in two chests. One heart beating in two chests. This is the sukoon, the mawadda, the rahma we should aspire to. In the end, I will say this. Marriage is not meant to be hard. The challenges life throws at us are hard, and how we respond to it as husband and wife is the key. In fact, if anything, marriage should make life easier. Yes, we go into an Islamic marriage without full understanding of our spouse's personality, habits, tendencies, vices. But we also discover qualities in our spouse that make us a better person, that equip us to move forward in life. A great marriage is not when the perfect couple comes together. It is when an imperfect couple learns to appreciate and benefit from the differences. The Promised Messiah Islam said the relationship between husband and wife should be as between two true and sincere friends. The primary witness of a person's high morals and qualities and of his relationship with God is his wife. If his relationship with his wife is not good, it is not possible that he should be at peace with God. How profound of a statement. Our sukoon, our peace with God, is contingent upon our sukoon in our marriage. Now those of you in the audience who are not married may be wondering, why even do it? Why even get married if there are so many challenges? I can just do this alone. Well, maybe you can. But remember, the Prophet ﷺ said marriage completes the faith. And many, many sitting here today can testify to this. Marriage makes you whole. It fills in the voids in your spirituality and enables you to fill the voids in your spouses. 
The Holy Prophet وسلم, said, this world is a provision for us. And of all the bounties in this world, of all the provisions in this world, the best provision is a pious woman. Why would you not want this bounty? And the Promised Messiah said, one of the reasons to get married is to remove the pains of loneliness. Marriage isn't about the short game, it's about the long game. Beauty is fleeting, age only goes in one direction, wealth and possession have no certainty, but companionship is irreplaceable. And th that is what you will cherish long into your marriage. Seek comfort in your spouses. My dear brothers and sisters, I often get asked by the youth, does an arranged marriage work? The way we do things, that Rishta is suggested and accepted, and two people who've never been together now will live in love and harmony. Does it really work? Well, when you look around this hall, or the Lajna, when you look around the ladies' hall, there are many examples which tell us, yes, it does work. And there's examples of our own parents, grandparents, our ancestors that tell us that it works. But the best example is the one I will share in a brief story, and I'll end with this. There once lived a woman in a city called Sarif in the outskirts of Mecca. Her name was Barra. She was 36 years old and widowed. When the Holy Prophet ﷺ was making his first pilgrimage to Mecca after seven years after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, on the way a companion suggested that he marry Barra, as she was a very pious woman and she was a widow and she was alone. So in Sarif, the Holy Prophet ﷺ married Barra and would later give her the name Mamuna, which means glad tidings, because it was during his blessed return home to Mecca that he married her. Hazrat Mamuna anha, was the Prophet's wife until his final breath. During this marriage of just three years, she treated him with love and compassion, educated the followers in the Prophet's teachings, and treated his in-laws with respect. Hazrat Aisha anha, reportedly said, Hazrat Mamuna was the most righteous of the wives. After the Holy Prophet وسلم, passed away, Hazrat Mamuna anha, went on to live another 50 years. And at the old age of 80, as she was nearing her end, she conveyed one single dying wish that she be buried in the same place where she first met the Holy Prophet وسلم, on that night in Sada 50 years earlier. My dear brothers and sisters, Hazrat Mamuna lived a full life. Of those, only three were spent in the companionship of the Holy Prophet Wasallam as his wife. But the sakoon, the mawadda, the rahmah, she experienced in those few years were what she coveted above everything else. Hazrat Mamuna was the last to join the ranks of the Ummul Mumineen, and her grave in Sadif to this very day serves as a monument to the love she found in the righteous model of our beloved master, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So my dear youth, does it work, you ask? Yes, it does work, because it has always worked. Some of you may be thinking, that was then, that was a long time ago, this is now. Well, the numbers speak for themselves. You can date and marry with a 50-50 chance of making it past 10 years. Or you can trust Allah's miracle, put your faith in your own faith, and love the one you marry and find sukoon, like one heart beating in two chests. I close by praying that may Allah enable me first and all of us to be righteous in our lives with our spouses and our children. May Allah accept the immense sacrifices of my wife, who is my best friend, and the sacrifices of all of our spouses who withstand our flaws and tolerate our faults and complete our faith. May he enable us to get closer to him by living with our spouses in sukoon, in mawadda, in rahma. ربنا حبلنا من ازواجنا وزرياتنا قرط عيون فجعلنا للمتقين اماما او ماي لورد گرانت اس اف اور وائفز اینڈ چلڈرن دی ڈیلائٹ اف اور آئز اینڈ میک اس ا ماڈل فار دی رائٹیس فاخر او دعوانا ان الحمد لله رب العالمین Please.
individuals participating in the jasa in Kadian when the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, had that first jasa. And now we're looking at one, maybe here over the weekend, it's a good possibility we might have 30,000. You know, we said Kulu Jamia, we were coming together, breaking bread, having good tea and, and good conversation and more important prayer. So it's really a joy to come to the jasa see your brothers you have been seen for some time a year sometime many years and this is the spirit of the jalsa this is the spirit of you know manifesting the true spirit of heart of and this is what jalsa is all about <laughs> the promised messiah salam, once stated Whenever Islam has been confronted with any other religion in consequence of some new condition of the age, the sharp and effective instrument that has immediately come to hand is the Holy Qur'an. In the same way, whenever philosophic thought has been given publicity in opposition to it, the Holy Qur'an has destroyed that poisonous plant and has so humiliated it as to provide a mirror to its students which shows up the true philosophy which is contained in the Holy Qur'an alone and nowhere else. In the modern age, when Christian missionaries started their propaganda and made an attempt to draw away unintelligent and ignorant people from the unity of God and to make them worship a humble creature and employed every kind of sophistry for dressing up their doubtful ideas and thus created a storm in India, it was the Holy Qur'an which repelled them so that they are not now able to face a well-informed person and their extensive apologetics have been folded up like a piece of paper. Izala al-Ham, Rohani Khazain, Volume 3, pages 381 to 382. <laughs> We moved to USA in 2015 from Rabba, Pakistan. And even though I lived in Rabba, there were so many events that we attended. We had Ilmi rallies and we had sport rallies. But Jalsa Salana is a completely different feeling. I remember when I first time attended Jalsa in USA, seeing that many people coming together as a spiritual gathering. So Jalsa Salana really changes you. It changes your heart. Last year I was serving uh, in the daftar, khidmat khalq daftar, and I was assigned the Nazim volunteer management. We had a lot of volunteers, we had 300 plus volunteers, that's like most khidmat khalq have ever had at any uh, jalsa in USA. So managing that many volunteers, interacting with them and realizing that everyone is there for only one purpose. Everyone wants to come closer to Allah Ta'ala and serve jamaat e ahmdiya So I think that brotherhood, you can't find it anywhere else at any other event. Mm-hmm. 
जमालो हुसने कुर आनूर जाने इफ वी सी द हाउ द होली क्रॉन ट्रांसफॉर्म पीपल इंडिविजुअली और कलेक्टिवली the greatest example we find uh, is from the time of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we know the uh, the condition of the arabs was at that time and how the holy quran transformed each and every person at that at that time during the time of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how they were they had no knowledge and through the holy quran god almighty guided them to the right path and they were able to transform themselves uh, individually by studying the holy quran and uh, understanding it and then acting upon those teachings hamara chand quran hai as huzur anbar ayatullah taala bin sal aziz Uh, reminded us again and again that not only that we read the holy quran but we need to understand it and then we need to act upon its teachings and when we look at collectively the holy quran says that you are the best people raised for the good of mankind you enjoin what is good and forbid evil and believe in allah so here we find that when people transform themselves then they invite other people towards goodness and they motivate them they they should act upon the teachings and that's how uh, we see that uh, collectively they were able to transform themselves kalam e pak e rahma hai noor e fur Assalamu alaikum welcome back to the studio here alhamdulillah what a wonderful day absolutely amazing jam packed with so many you know speeches that were just so enlightening so inspiring um uh, bali sahab we we'll start with you what did you feel was one of, one of those points that were mentioned that was just very powerful that really yeah. hit your heart today assalamu alaikum alhamdulillah ma apne nazreen ko dobara mta usa 2023 ke studio se khush aamdeed kehte hain खुदा तौर के फजल से अभी अभी जलसा सलाना अमरीका के पहले दिन की कार्रवाई का जो है वो अख्ताम हुआ है और इसमें बड़ी ही बाज अहम तकारीर की गई अहम मौजूद पर जो है वो तकारीर की गई एक खास बात जो एक किस्म की हाई लाइट कह सकते हैं इस सेशन की हुई था कि बाज का शादी शुदा जिंदगी में जो मुश्किल पेश आ सकती है वो किस किस तरह उनसे निपटा जाए और क्या बाज रहनुमा असूल हैं जो हजरत सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम ने हमारे सामने रखे हैं और कैसे हम अपनी इस दवाजी जिंदगी को खुशहाल कर सकते हैं तो उसमें बाज ऐसी बातें बताई गई थी जो मेरे नज़दीक बड़ी ही अहम है और उसको हम अपनी रोजमर्रा जिंदगी में अपना सकते हैं हाँ बिल्कुल you know some of the points about uh, you know about forgiveness for example unconditional forgiveness very critical because again as was mentioned in the speech people will forgive and then they'll add a but you know that's a serious issue especially in the culture that kind of um it, you know allows this kind of culture to exist where we don't forgive properly and then there's instances as mentioned in the speech that what do you do afterwards now forgiveness is gone so again there's a lot to 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 unpack from the different speeches that were mentioned today especially the mention ji hazrat saab ka jo paigham tha jamaat amdi america ke liye khaas taur par bada hi aham tha aur zul ne usme do baaton ki taraf hum itwajjo dilaya hai jo ke hazrat akdis musim aur ul islam ne bhi farmaya hai ki meri besad ke do maqasad hai ek to ye 
کہ مخلوق کا خالق کے ساتھ جو رشتہ ہے اس کو مضبوط کیا جائے اور دوسرا مخلوق کا دوسرے لوگوں کے ساتھ دوسری مخلوق کے ساتھ جو رابطہ ہے اس کو دوبارہ جو ہے وہ بحال کیا جائے اور ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ اچھے طریقے سے پیش آئیں تو میرا خیال حضرت اکتس اکلیت المسی الخامس نے جو ہمیں پیغام بھیجا ہے وہ ضروری ہے کہ ہم اس کو جو ہے اپنی زندگیوں میں اپنائے اور پھر حضور نے تبلیغ کی طرف بھی جماعت کے افراد کو توجہ دلائی ہے کہ امریکہ کے جو ابتدائی مبلغین تھے ان کی کاوشوں سے کئی لوگ جو ہیں وہ احمدیت کی آگوش میں ہے اب ہمارا فرض ہے کہ اس کو مزید آگے لے کے جائیں اور پہلے کی طرح دوبارہ زیادہ سے زیادہ لوگ جو ہیں وہ جماعت احمدیہ میں شامل ہوں تو یہ ہم ہم پر فرض ہے کہ ہم تبلیغ کی جو اپنی کوششیں ہیں ان کو بھی مزید بڑھائیں And again, so beautifully, Hazur reminded us of that. So the next three days, we should keep reflecting on that message that beloved Hazur has sent us. And as you mentioned, tabligh. Tabligh is very critical. And these two things is what we're going to gift wrap and give to the world. And this jalsa is really the best platform to do that, is to be able to, again, share these messages. And I think all the speeches were exactly in line with what beloved Hazur was saying. That as long as we keep remembering that we need to connect with Allah Almighty, we need to connect with our fellow being, you know, fellow human beings with service to humanity, that would be the best way to, to build it again. And so similarly, we saw in today's, one of the speeches that we had again was about 10 years after marriage and how that, you know, affects our lives. And it's interesting how they picked 10 years because a good kind of metric to check. And I think it was very beautifully mentioned how there's so many challenges that exist. And all of those challenges, we can trace the, uh, the solutions to them all the way back to the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam's life. How beautiful is that? Whether it was domestic violence or it was you know, uh, disharmony in the home, whether it was arguments, whatever those issues are that we you know, see on a daily basis, sometimes even it was mentioned so beautifully that you have to be, you have to be cognizant of the fact that Your spouse has certain needs and has certain ways of, of, of you know, showing your affection, for example. There were so many beautiful points that were mentioned back to back that really helped inspire, I think, the audience in general. And that is exactly the purpose of this Jalsa Salana. We take it back even to the Friday sermon that beloved Azur gave us this morning. We heard a beautiful accounts of how the Sahaba followed the example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every step of the way, every element was try to follow his example. And then you see that, you know, as we go throughout the day, we've heard speeches, we've heard a message from beloved Hazur, which also beautifully reflected on these exact, you know, same concepts. And then we heard these three speeches. For example, we heard selective, uh, you know, memory is good to have when you're dealing with the good things of your spouse. But then you should have selective amnesia when you're trying to look at some of the bad things or some of the shortcomings that your spouse has. So again, there were many, many topics that were beautifully covered in today's speeches. They all, you know, it's amazing again, how they were directed back to the words of our khulafa, the guidances of our khulafa, or the words of the promised Messiah or again, back to the words and guidances of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because that is really where we, we get all of our, our guidance from. And that is exactly how I think in today's speeches, there's so many points, I was writing down a number of them. And uh, you know, the audience is probably watching from outside. There were thousands of people sitting there, all glued to the speeches, listening attentively. We had children walking around and just doing duties. There were signs to remain seated, but everybody was sitting very patiently, very nicely. And that was very beautiful to see because you have duties, you have these speeches that are going on. And, and that again shows us exactly how powerful this, this Jalsa Salana really is. And I remember a few years back how, uh, you know, a few years back I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've asked people, especially people who have converted, and they have said that it's, it's absolutely amazing to experience the Jalsa Salana. So now before we keep telling you about what's happening here, let's connect with our social media handles and see what... All of you are sharing. I hope you're connecting with us on Jalsa Connect as well. And many of the hashtags that are being shared about Jalsa Salana USA or Jalsa USA 2023. Whatever those are, we want to take it to the social media handles now and see exactly how you are engaging with us today. Noor Furka Oh, 
Alhamdulillah, they're saying now that Takbir, they're you know heading towards the the the, the Jalsa, mashallah. This is exactly the kind of spirit when we see it in our children, it really you know empowers us, makes us feel very excited of that. So many people, whether young and old, really take benefit from this beautiful Jalsa Salana. شکروش کے ساتھ جلسہ سالانہ کی جو نشریات ہے اس میں شامل ہو رہے ہیں نظمیں پڑھ کے نعرے لگا کر اور اپنے اپنے طریق سے محبت کا اظہار کر رہے ہیں جس میں شامل ہونے کے لیے اور یہاں بھی ہم نے دیکھا کہ کئی بچے جو ہیں مختلف قسم کی ڈیوٹیز دے رہے ہیں بڑے شوق کے ساتھ کوئی پانی پلا رہا ہے کوئی ڈسپلن کی ڈیوٹی کر رہا ہے کوئی بتا رہا ہے کہ یہاں سے آپ نے کھانا کھانا ہے تو بچوں کو دیکھ کر بھی خاص قسم کا جوش بڑوں میں بھی اٹھتا ہے کہ یہ ہے جیسے حضرت قسم سیم علیہ السلام نے فرمایا تھا کہ سب کی تربیت جو ہے اس جلسہ کے ذریعے ہوگی تو یہ بچے ہی ہیں جنہوں نے کل کو جو ہے بڑے ہو کر جماعت کی باغ دوڑ سنبھال دی ہے تو بڑی ضروری بات ہے کہ بچوں کو بھی لوگ جلسہ سرانہ پر لے کے آئیں تاکہ ان کی تربیت بھی ہو اپنے دوستوں سے بھی ملیں اور روحانی ماحول میں جو ہے ان کی پرورش ہو Again, Jazakallah for everybody tuning in. You've seen we have some, some, you know, some technical difficulties. That's okay. This is all part of the experience of Jazza Salana. This is all part of the, the, you know, the, the, the blessings that we get. Because remember, conferences, conventions happen everywhere. Even in America, a lot of us, maybe you know, for employment, we go to conferences. But this conference is dedicated for the, the spiritual reformation of ourselves. Really to, to reflect, to reassess, to see who we are. And walk away from the three days from now better. And that's why these small glitches that happen, it's okay. It's actually part of the experience to help, you know, uh, show us that, you know, these are things that we happen. We're all volunteers. It's natural. It's natural, natural. exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and again, it brings us back to so many of the, the beautiful things. Um, I remember years ago, I met one of our converts. Uh, he had been Ahmadi for many years, but he shared a, a very interesting experience. He said, look, when you go to our Jalsa speeches, you will not hear the audience say hallelujah or amen. You don't, you don't, you don't get that. And he said, although you don't get that at church, he said, I used to go to church, we would get that. He said, during that time, we would feel, you know, spiritually enhanced. He said, but the moment you get home that Sunday night, you forget it, it all disappears. <laughs> he said, but when I come to Jalsa, I listen to the speeches. We may not have that initial, you know, hallelujah type of experience. He said, but I go home and months later, جی جی اس میں وہ وہ متانت اور سنجیدگی ہوتی ہے جو کہ جلسہ سالانہ کی تقریر میں ہوتی ہے جلسہ سالانہ کے جو پروگرامز ہیں اس میں ہوتی ہے اور یہی ایک قسم کا جو جلسے کے مقاصد میں سے ہے کہ اللہ تعالیٰ جماعت احمدیہ کو توفیق دیتا ہے کہ جو قرآن کریم کی تعلیم ہے جو وہاں حضرت وسلم کی بتائی ہوئی باتیں ہیں جو حضرت اکدس مسیح محمد علیہ السلام کی لائے ہوئی تعلیمات ہے اس کی ایک قسم کی ریویژن ہو جاتی ہے دوبارہ اس کی دہرائی ہو جاتی ہے اور ہمیں پتہ چلتا ہے کس مقصد کی یہ جماعت جو ہے وہ قائم کی گئی ہے اور اللہ تعالیٰ کے فضل سے وہ مقصد پورا ہوتا دکھائی دیتا ہے اس قسم کے جو جلسہ سالانہ میں شمولیت کی وجہ سے thousands of miles away people are tuning in and it's only you know it's only expected that we want to connect with you it shouldn't be a one way streak we want to be able to hear from you and so alhamdulillah all day we have been hearing you know seeing so many different tweets and so many different submissions by all of you so we're going to go ahead and start show them now jazakallah
Sorry about that again. We're going to get those ready and, and then share with you. But I know, and I've been seeing all day long, we've been you know, filtering through so many of the different tweets, videos, clips that all of you have been sending us. Continue to send it. Inshallah, we'll be able to throw it on the screen as well. But we're receiving them and we're going through them. And we really appreciate it. This is how we were able to make that connection. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> اس کو ہمارے ساتھ جڑے رہے ہیں ہمارے پیغامات بھیجیں اپنے کہاں سے وہ جلسہ سلانہ کی نشریات جو ہیں وہ دیکھ رہے ہیں کس شہر سے کس ملک سے تاکہ وہ بھی ہمارے ساتھ ایک قسم کا جلسہ سلانہ کا حصہ ہوں اور جو حضرت مسیح علیہ السلام نے دعائیں کی ہیں وہ بھی اس ان کے حق میں بھی جو ہیں وہ پوری ہوں تو گھر میں بیٹھے ہوئے بھی وہ ہمارے ساتھ جو ہیں وہ جڑے رہ سکتے ہیں سو وی ہیو اے فیو پکچرز وی گن گو اینڈ پٹ دیم آن دی اسکرین سو اگین گیو اس اے فیو مومنٹس وی پٹ دیم آن دی اسکرین ایز ویل ایز ویل Again, we can see here that Sayyid Ahmed Awes has sent his dedicated volunteers at Jalsa Salana USA. Look at this, mashallah. Every year we see many of them, we will pots and pans. This is not an easy task. And everybody, mashallah, will spend that time volunteering. As we can see, tirelessly serve and delight meals to honor Jalsa Salana. The most difficult task of the food is the most difficult task. It's warm and it's easy to make food for thousands of people. It's not easy to make food for people. Look at this beautiful sign outside in Pennsylvania. Everybody driving by, thousands of cars are driving by, and they're seeing Jalsa Salana July 14th or 16th. Again, beautiful Jalakala for that share as well. Um, something we look forward to every year, you know, when we're driving down to park our cars. Um, Yes, Switzerland. It says Switzerland. Gee, you are sitting in Switzerland, waiting anxiously and excited for Jalsa Salana. Mashallah, beautiful. All the way from Switzerland, they are joining us as well today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, there is another Jalsa Salana in Canada, I believe, also this weekend. So we're glad that you're tuning into us. <laughs> Not necessarily <laughs> tuning in there. I'm yeah, sure you're tuning into both. Jalsa Salana Canada as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think absolutely. we are switching back and forth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ماشاءاللہ سوئٹزرلینڈ سے بھی ہمارے ساتھ جو ہے شامل ہو رہے ہیں لوگ جلسہ سے کینیڈا کا جلسہ بھی آج ہو رہا ہے تو وہاں سے بھی پیغامات آ رہے ہیں کہ دونوں جلسے کو ہم جو ہے ایک ہی وقت میں سننے کی کوشش کر رہے ہیں جو کہ مشکل ہے لیکن وہ دونوں جلسوں سے استفادہ کرنے کی جو ہے وہ کوشش کر رہے ہیں اس طرح اب جو بھی ہمیں پیغامات بھیجنا چاہیں سوشل میڈیا کے ذریعے سے وہ ضرور بھیجیں تاکہ ہم آپ کے پیغامات کو سب لوگوں کے سامنے جو ہے وہ پیش کر سکیں سب کے سامنے سنائیں تاکہ آپ بھی جلسے میں ایک قسم کے شمولیت کا جو ہے حق ادا کریں ایبسلوٹلی سو مسلم ٹی وی یو ایس اے از آر از آر ہینڈل اور جلسہ کنیکٹ یو ایس اے دیز آر دا ویز ٹو ویل کنٹینیو ٹو کنیکٹ ود سینڈ یور ویڈیو سینڈ یور پکچرز اگین از امیزنگ ویل گو اینڈ ریویو دوز اینڈ شیئر دم آن دی اسکرین ویل ڈو ایٹ آل تھرو آٹ ٹمارو ایز ویل اینڈ دیٹس دا بیوٹی آف اٹ از ٹو کنٹینیو ٹو شیئر اینڈ آئی تھنک دیٹ برنگز اس بیک to uh, you know the fact that there are people outside meeting the guests getting their you know feedback their you know the jalsa vibes you know the spirituality so let's go ahead and take the uh, take the video back to Muhammad Amin Choli Sahib and Abdullah Dibba Sahib who are on the ground uh, meeting many of our participants or the guests of the Promise of Messiah as we come to the close of day one of jalsa we heard Hazur's message, we heard three great speeches. Now we're in the bookstore at U.S. Jalsa. In the background, you can see a lot of guests still coming out of the Jalsa Ga. And I'm here with my co-host, Imam Abdullah Dibbasab. Dibbasab, can you share a little bit about the traditions of the Jamaat there? I know Amadi guests come, but do non-Amadis come to Jalsa as well? Absolutely. This is uh, Mike by Zakallah. And um, as you said, this is what makes Jalsa Jalsa. And that is people coming in. Primarily, Ahmadis from all over the country are coming in. But Jalsa is also to, for them to be able to share with them that what you see in my family, in me, it's not just with me. There's thousands of others that are across the country that come together. So come with us and come and experience that. That's the spirit of, of what Jalsa Salana is about. And as you can see, we're standing with some gentlemen here. And uh, they can introduce themselves and tell us what brings them to Jalsa Salana. Um, Brother Gerardo, you flew all the way in from Silicon Valley. For those who don't know, that's all the way on the west coast of the country. So it's a few hours flight. Tell us what brings you, who brought you, and how's your experience so far? Um, the experience is amazing. Uh, I, it's the first time I've ever been to one of these. But I was invited by my dear friend Salim, Salim Kadir. And um, yeah, it was the first time and I was really welcomed here and uh, came to know the experience and the love that these kind of uh, meetings bring, bring to you. And so yeah, I've just been uh, astonished and amazed by how, how loving everyone is and welcoming. How long have you known, closer, right? how, how long have you known uh, Salim for? You uh, 40 years, uh, 40 years. We're high school buddies and so yeah, it, uh, yeah it, it's, it's, 
it's, it's warming because his whole family is very welcoming to me and it, it's, everyone here is also very welcoming. Absolutely, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then secondly, we also have a Kamal Dean Moili uh, who is now in LA. You've been in the United States for a long time. I know back home you come from a different country. Tell us about it. How's your experience so far and, and how have you been finding Jalsa? Alhamdulillah, uh, the Jalsa is one thing that I look forward to um, every year because when you hear very inspiring lectures and uh, above all, you meet your brothers that you have not met for a long time. So catching up with brothers and kind of sharing experience, the past years and things that have happened in your life, new stuff, and also uh, try to kind of um, grow spiritually uh, in these uh, 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 events is one thing that I look for in, in this jazz. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I think that's something we all share, right? That's absolutely true. Two more guests to us up. I wanted to share a little bit about uh, our next guest is Dwayne Hess. He's from the uh, city of Baltimore, which is not too far from here. And you came to Jelsa, Jelsa the convention, to, to do what? What do you want to get out of Jelsa? I'm a Christian seminary student, and uh, I have to do a project where I'm learning about someone that's different from me. And so the Baltimore community has been so welcoming. The the mosque there has been so welcoming to me, and they invited me to this event, and it's been a beautiful experience so far. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And we um, we have our next guest is Echo, 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 Mike, Micro. Um, Echo, you, you are in the Virginia area. Um, what break keeps bringing you back? to Joel Sano, you're originally from Ghana as well. I'm from Ghana, and um, Jessa has been um, a part of our life since uh, when I was back in Ghana. Every year, Jessa comes on and we attend. And it's a spiritual reunion when sometimes um, your spirit goes down. When we go to the Jessa, it renews our spirit. And um, come to um, learn a lot from others meet a lot of friends, um, a lot of friends and uh, couples, activities, all that comes along in the life. So it's, uh, it's inspiring to be part of um, this occasion. And, and Dwayne, real quick, um, what did you, uh, were you able to listen to some of the speeches on day one that um, covered a wide array of issues? Yeah, so far there were uh, a lot of things. Some of the things I heard, I thought to myself they were very familiar and very similar to some of the Christian ideals that I grew up with. And then there were some other things that were new and kind of stretching and things to think about. That, that's, that's great. Uh, Debasat, uh, how many guests are here? Do you want to sh uh, share a little bit as we close out day one of Jalsa? Um, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but just been going around in the food area and in the prayer time, it's just amazing to see the, the diversity of the people and the tons of people. Personally, I drove 13 hours. We came in four different vans to attend Jalsa Salana with my kids. My youngest kid is one year, one year old. So, so it's, been, it's been really amazing for me personally. And then just to see all these guests. You know, so for now, we'll pass it on back into the studio. Uh, we have our colleagues that are sitting in there, and they will tell, tell you more about Jalsa. Jazakallah, Jazakallah, Diva Sahib and Muhammad Amachari Sahib. Amazing interviews, brought all those guests out, got their impressions. It's always nice, nice to see exactly, you know, the impressions of the audience. And it's always nice, by the way, to see interviews with Dibasa because everybody has to look up just to talk to him. <laughs> I love that aspect. But anyway, this brings us to the conclusion of our day today. Um, Jazakallah to everybody who has joined us today for this YouTube live stream. We will have it again, inshallah, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Please join us tomorrow morning as well um, so that we can continue to have this uh, this discussion and these impressions and to be part of this spiritual vibe, inshallah. Yes, Jazakumullah. We have reached the first day of the day. We want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. We want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. We want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. We want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today. कल सुबह जलसा सलाना की जो कार्रवाई है वो नौ बजे शुरू होगी जो स्टूडियो की कार्रवाई है नौ बजे शुरू होगी जलसा सलाना दस बजे शुरू होगा इसमें सैनिट टाइम के मुताबिक तो हम उम्मीद करते हैं कि आप कल भी हमारे साथ होंगे तब तक के लिए अल्लाह हाफिज अस्सलाम वालेकुम रहमतुल्लाह वरकत हो Bye.
Don't need them ever? Okay. And for those, yeah, they just need them. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm in seat one. I do not hear any... Can you interrupt IFB1 for me? Okay, I hear you there. I do not have any program. Um, I have no audio listen right now. So I'm going to turn this down because you've out killed me. I know that's not your fault. So now we got to track down where the audio is actually going. So I will come back out there to sort that out.
اور اس زمانے میں آپ کے غلام صادق کے ساتھ کیا گیا عہد بیت ہے اور جماعت احمدیہ مسلمہ میں شامل ہونے کا عہد بیت ہے بس جو کوئی اپنے آپ کو جماعت احمدیہ میں شامل سمجھتا ہے اس کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ اپنے بیت کے عہد کو پورا کرے اور اس میں جیسا کہ پہلے ذکر کیا جا چکا ہے کہ قرآن کریم کی حکومت کو اپنے اوپر لاگو کرے اسے قبول کرے تب ہی وہ ان لوگوں میں شمار ہو سکتا ہے جو اللہ تعالیٰ کے پسندیدہ ہیں اور اللہ تعالیٰ ان سے محبت کرتا ہے اللہ تعالیٰ فرماتا ہے کہ بلا من اوفا بیاد ہی و تقا ان اللہ حب المتقین ہاں کیوں نہیں جس نے بھی اپنے عہد کو پورا کیا اور تقوا اختیار کیا تو اللہ تعالیٰ متقیوں سے محبت کرنے والا ہے بس اپنے عہد جو اللہ تعالیٰ سے کیے ہیں یعنی اسلام کی تعلیم پر عمل کرنے کے عہد اور پھر ان پر تقوا سے کام لیتے ہوئے عمل کرتے ہیں وہ اللہ تعالیٰ کے محبوب بن جاتے ہیں پھر لوگ اور ایک مومنہ کو اور ایک مومن کو یہی زندگی کا مقصد ہے اس کے لیے کوشش کرنی چاہیے اور ان لوگوں میں شمار ہونا چاہیے جن سے اللہ تعالیٰ محبت کرتا ہے ان لوگوں میں شمار ہونے کی کوشش کرنی چاہیے جن سے اللہ تعالیٰ محبت کرتا ہے بس ہم میں سے ہر ایک کا فرض بنتا ہے کہ ہم نے اپنے بیت کے عہد میں جو نیک باتوں کو کرنے کا عہد کیا ہے اسے پورا کریں ورنہ بیت کرنا بے فائدہ ہے اگر بیت کر کے اپنی مرضی کرنی ہے اور قرآن کریم کی حکومت اپنے اوپر لاگو نہیں کرنی تو پھر تو ایسا عمل ہے جس کی خدا کی نظر میں کوئی وقت نہیں ہے اور دنیا والوں کی مخالفت بھی ساتھ ہی ہے ایک اہم دیکھیں جتنی مخالفت ہو رہی ہے اور شاید کسی کی ہوتی ہو تو اس کا کیا فائدہ کہ بیت بھی کی اللہ تعالیٰ کی رضا مندی بھی حاصل نہ کی اور لوگوں کی مخالفت بھی مول لے لی بس اگر اللہ تعالیٰ کی محبت کو جذب کرنا ہے تو تقوا پر چلتے ہوئے اپنے عہدوں کو پورا کرنے کی ضرورت ہے اور اللہ تعالیٰ نے جو حکم دیا ہے کہ نیکیوں کو اختیار کرو اور برائیوں کو ترک کرو جن کا پہلے ذکر ہو چکا ہے تو یہ اللہ تعالیٰ کے عہد ہیں اور پھر ان نیکیوں کو پھیلانے کے لیے اللہ تعالیٰ کے نام پر اور اسے ضامن بنا کر جو عہد ہوتے ہیں جو گو بندوں کے درمیان عہد ہوتے ہیں لیکن کیونکہ خدا تعالیٰ کی تعلیم کے مطابق اور ان کے نا اس کے نام پر ہیں اس لیے یہ عہد بھی پورا کرنا ضروری ہے اور اللہ تعالیٰ نے دوسری جگہ فرمایا ہے کہ تمہاری تمہارے عہدوں کی وجہ سے بات پرس ہوگی تم پوچھے جاؤ گے کہ تم نے اللہ تعالیٰ کے حکام پر یا حکام کے مطابق جو آپس میں معاہدات کیے تھے 